Everyone, I'm Kate Ford, and we've concluded closed session this evening. And on May 25th, 2021, at 6.50 p.m., I'm calling to order this regular meeting of the Santa Barbara Unified School Board. And now for information about interpretation of this meeting. Thank you, Board President Ford. Good evening. I will give this announcement regarding language interpretation in both English and Spanish. Buenas tardes, voy a dar este anuncio sobre la interpretación en inglés y en español. In order to provide language access, we will be providing simultaneous bidirectional interpretation in English and Spanish. If you are bilingual, you do not have to click anything. If you are not bilingual in English and Spanish, you will have to select your language in order to hear the interpretation. If you are using a laptop or a desktop, at the bottom right of your screen, you will see a globe icon that says interpretation. Please click on the globe now and select English. If you are using an iPad or a phone, locate the three dot menu and select language interpretation, then select English and click done. And remember when it's your turn to speak, please remember to be loud and clear. And we are also offering American Sign Language ASL interpretation for this meeting. If you will be using ASL interpretation, please use the Zoom app on your computer, tablet, or phone to join this meeting. If you joined this meeting through your web browser, you, you may not be able to see the ASL interpreter at all times. Esta reunión contará con interpretación simultánea bidireccional en inglés y en español. Si usted es bilingüe, no tiene que presionar nada. Si usted no es bilingüe, tendrá que elegir su idioma para escuchar la interpretación. Si está usando una computadora, verá un icono en la parte inferior de su pantalla a la derecha en forma de globo que dice interpretación. Haga clic ahí ahora y seleccione español. Si está usando un iPad o su teléfono, localice el menú de tres puntos, haga clic en interpretación de idiomas, elija español y finalizar. Si está en inglés, puede que diga done. Y recuerde, cuando sea su turno de hablar, por favor recuerde hablar con voz fuerte y clara. Gracias. Thank you. We may now begin. Thank you. Superintendent Dr. Maldonado, please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. My pleasure. Good evening, everyone. Please stand, face the flag, put your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now we will continue with the agenda, and that is the announcement of a closed session action. During closed session today, interviews with four finalists were held for the position of student board member. As a result, I would like to announce that there was a motion made by Ms. Alvarez and seconded by Ms. Capps to approve the appointment of Dawson Kelly from San Marcos High School as the new student board member. Dawson will start in July. Um, we're so grateful to all the students who interviewed with us and made our decision very, very difficult. We congratulate all four finalists. And I believe that we all get to congratulate Dawson in person, or shall I say over Zoom. Hello. Um, I don't know if now is my time to speak, but... It is, Dawson. Go ahead and speak. <laughs> I'm on Welcome. The Zoom. Yes. Thank you. Um, I'm honored to have this position. Uh, I guess I should give a brief bio about myself, correct? Sure. Okay, well, um, my name is Austin Kelly. I am a sophomore at San Marcos and I am the student board member. Well, really exciting to say that. Um, I heard about it. I got the news like 20 minutes ago, so I'm still very excited and honored. Um, I hope that I can bring change and give input to this board from a student perspective. I will make sure to reach out to uh, every student in SB Unified with the goal to make education more equitable and hopefully to get more mental health services on campus. I'm really excited for this opportunity and thank you so much for the board for selecting me. Thank you and we look forward to seeing you in July. Thank you so much. Bye. 
As you can see, the board and the cabinet are once again meeting in person and the public is participating through live streaming on YouTube. And thank you so much to all of you for participating in any way that you can. Tonight we also have our two regularly scheduled reports, COVID-19 at around 7 and the Summer of Learning at 8 p.m. And the board does take a break at 8.30. So, Dr. Maldonado, how about your report to the board before we do the COVID-19 report? Absolutely, Board President Ford. I will try my best to keep it uh, under that time, but we'll get to our COVID report soon after 7. Sure. So good evening, board members, staff, family, and community members. I'd like to begin my report by acknowledging the impacts related to the recent fire that occurred in our community near the Mesa. We thank the local firefighters, first responders, and law enforcement for their swift response to the incident. Many of you may know that the fire was dangerously close to McKinley Elementary School and many of our families in that area were literally in the line of fire. As educators, we wear many hats. When a crisis hits, we move into operations and crisis management mode. With Dr. Wagenick as our fearless leader, we were in constant contact with fire department officials to monitor the situation and were able to put a strategy in place to get updates and information to our McKinley staff and families. We route everyone to a distance learning day for Friday and ensure that students who needed a place to go were able to get there. In the end, I want to acknowledge the teamwork that took place across the district to coordinate this effort. I had a fun and busy weekend. It included watching my own son's virtual graduation from Cal State Northridge. Congratulations to Joshua. I also covered a lot of territory on Saturday. I stopped by the San Marcos Girls Soccer CIF Championship Qualifier game against South Pasadena where our girls pulled off a win and are now heading to the CIF Finals. The game will be played this Friday at Dos Pueblos against Paraclete High School. I stopped by Santa Barbara High's reimagined prom at Peabody Stadium, and it looked like all students were having a really nice time, and I really appreciate the, the staff at Santa Barbara High for having a youth culture-oriented prom. I ended the evening at Dos Pueblos High's musical production of Pippin, which was a truly spectacular event. Totally innovative in that it was a hybrid production that included in person with mixed media performances. This evening, I've invited three graduating seniors to join us. I had the pleasure of personally meeting Jose Miguel Arroyo and Joshua Cruz Soriano, and I've heard many wonderful things about Dulce Cobian Flores, who is also here. You can read more about all of them in my Friday superintendent's video on our website and our social media channels. All three of these students recently enrolled in our high schools as their first US school experience and have really pushed themselves to excel in all of their courses, meet new students, and learn about the culture of the U.S. at a Santa Barbara High School. This includes the ability to master content while excelling in mastering it in a second language. Speaking, reading, writing in English to express their deep content language, deep content and language learning is something to be proud of. I've asked them to all three to answer the following question tonight and share their recipe for success. So first we will ask, uh, I'll ask Ms. Trujillo, can you tell me uh, who is the first person to come on? We have Joshua Cruz Soriano. Joshua, welcome. And Joshua, please let the board members, our audience and our staff know what was your recipe for being successful? Hi. Um, well, my recipe was like uh, being a good student and do my best every time and take risks and improve my skills. And sometimes uh, I help some students uh, who are learning English because they, they don't understand the language. So I help them and I make them to improve uh, their, themselves to don't be like shy persons and being a, a better students for the future. Thank you for sharing that and for being a top Don at Santa Barbara High School. Congratulations and we look to hearing more about you. Thank you. Ms. Trujillo, who's next, please? Next we have Jose Miguel Arroyo. If you can turn on your camera, Jose, there you go. Hello, my name is Miguel Arroyo. Uh, my recipe for being success at high school, it's uh, always trying my best uh, in my classes 
um, helping other students uh, who are in the same position as me. Um, and also, <clears throat> always trying my best uh, in all my classes. Uh, always asking my teachers about questions. Uh, never stay like quiet. I always ask and ask and ask. Excellent. That's a leadership quality as well. Thank you, Jose. We can give him a nice round of applause. And last, I believe we have Dulce. Correct. Who is a world language top don and a Santa Barbara High School distinguished don. Welcome, Dulce. Hi, good afternoon, and thanks for inviting me. I think that don't exist a perfect formula for being a successful person. But I can say that dedication is a great factor. Clearly, I am not yet as successful as I want to be one day, but being dedicated to my students is something that really helped me to be focused on my, on my subjects. Uh, when I start to be dedicated on all the things that I do, I really understand how important it is to work hard because in the real world, there is no one person that can do the work that you need to do. Thank you so much, Dulce. So board members and, and staff and the public, you can see how our students have the recipe for success. So we can give Dulce a nice round of applause. Thank you all three for joining us. Board members, do you have any questions for our top students? Thank you, Jose, Joshua, and Dulce for being with us today. Thank you. Next board members, um, I want to recognize, I thank you all for wearing your green uh, ribbons. This month is Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, some of you know that I personally have been impacted by a family member who suffered from mental health issues. And many of us have personally either known someone who has struggled with mental health, and we would like for, to ask everyone to show their support in solidarity by really working towards busting some of the myths around what mental health is. It starts with educating yourself and others, seeing the person as a person and not just their condition, and taking action. Many people are wearing green ribbons to promote mental health awareness in our schools and community. Thank you to our community partners and staff who care about our students and provide them with ongoing support. And to close out my, my report today, I wanna to close with a brief clip of some of the graduating seniors we honored this week as we come in to close on the final week of school. So board president Ford and board members, it is indeed a great place to work at at SB Unified. As you can see, we are still hiring. And I wanna end by letting the board members know that I'm also adding a cord to graduating seniors this year. Mr. Rouse and I, along with principals, have looked for students who have made significant progress 
from uh, the last school year to this school year, and we're calling it the Resiliency Award. Students will be receiving an additional silver cord to go with their graduation uh, regalia as a, an additional award. And we hope to make that a tradition so that we can really look at what resiliency looks like. And sometimes we may be a little behind, but we can always catch up. And we wanna make sure that we recognize those students as well. Ms. Wendy Simsmo and I've taken your uh, comments to heart. We are looking for the successes as well as the improvements. So thank you, and that concludes my report. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Maldonado. It's so inspiring to hear the stories of all the students. In addition to the four students we interviewed today and all of the triumphs on the sports field and in the theater, and just um, your focus on students. So thank you so much. As it is 7.06, I think it is time to move on to our regularly scheduled COVID-19 report. And it is report number 21. So first of all, uh, should I just turn it over to you, Ms. Mold? Uh, we'll just start with Dr. Okay, Dr. Wagner. All right, good evening, board. I bring to you uh, COVID board report number 21. Um, next slide, please. Um, Again, we organize our work and have for the past 15 months around these drivers, making sure that we are attending to all aspects of the work. Next slide. Um, I'm going to just quickly turn it over to Susan Klein Rothschild to give us an update from the county. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight. Here we are at the end of the school year, and we are seeing such good things in terms of COVID tonight. Um, I want you to know that we are still in the orange tier. That is the same tier we've been in since April 19th. Our adjusted case rate is 2.0. For us to go to the yellow tier, we have to be below two. So if we were 1.9, we would meet the criteria for yellow tier. It is likely to happen very, very soon. Our, for our positivity rate, the health equity rate, all those other numbers from the California P Department of Public Health are very positive. So we are very excited about that. Um, well, I'm trying to think of the other things that are important for me to share with you. One of the things that, that I'd like to share is that we have, um, we have important things to know about what the regulations and the re requirements are. Um, so here we are, I'm sorry, I'm seeing the screen now. Uh, those are the numbers and the rates we have for this week. Next slide, please. Uh, that's, all, that's what we got from you. Susan. Okay, may I, may I just share a few things more yes. real quick for you to know. Um, we are still in the orange tier. We are still required to follow the California Department of Public Health guidelines. And that means the guidance is we have the same expectations in schools now that we did at the beginning of the year in, in January and February. So there are still requirements about wearing masks, about physical distance, about screening. All those things continue for us in our schools. And our schools are planning for graduations and for them to have graduation ceremonies in person, they must follow the California Department of Public Health guidance, which means they have limited capacity and to have more people and more guests at the graduations, they must have proof of vaccination or tests. So please know that the schools and the high schools that are having graduation ceremonies they are following the California Department of Public Health guidance. It's important that we follow the guidance that. Beyond the blueprint. And what does that mean? Outside of schools, it is likely that we will have no, not have capacity limits. We will not have physical distancing in most environments unless there are mega events or large events. We will still have guidance for schools and sports. We expect new guidance to come soon. So when we get it, we'll share it. 
our numbers are headed in such a positive direction though. So we're hopeful to have more flexibility and looking forward to having students in school full time in the next year. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Uh, next slide. So um, this is the update um, on our COVID case rate. We have had six additional reported cases since we met two weeks ago. These were all students, elementary, junior high, and high school students uh, make up those six. Um, so that's, we're really continuing to slow down. We just interesting to note that we have not had an additional uh, staff case in over a month. And we attribute that to our high rate of vaccinations. Uh, we continue to not have transmissions on campus. And that's all good news. Next slide. Our surveillance testing has um, uh, gone down quite a bit because we no longer um, offer, or offer surveillance testing for those who are fully vaccinated. That was a, a directive given to us by public health that we only do surveillance testing with those who are not fully vaccinated. And then um, in athletics, we continue to test our athletes um, until they reach the yellow tier. As uh, we heard earlier, we have students competing in, in CIF, and in fact, in the championships. And because of the late start to athletics, we're going to have teams um, continuing to compete well into June. So we will continue to test those who need to be tested. Next slide. Uh, exciting news, and that is that we are part of the vaccination solution. And uh, last week at Lacumber Junior High uh, in the Joanne Keynes Theater, 68 students were vaccinated in, from grades seven and eight. And then today we opened um, a three-day vaccination clinic that's open to um, the entire community, but we are targeting students uh, 12 and up. Today we had over 200 students and family members signed up to participate in that. And so I'll have an update on that. We will continue uh, working with Santa Barbara County Public Health and the neighborhood clinics to provide these vaccination clinics to our students and their families throughout the summer. Next slide. So um, Susan was just talking about the end of year ceremonies. Um, I appreciate her emphasizing that the guidelines that we're putting out, the regulations, all of it is based on the blueprint uh, for live events. That's what we're following. These are not um, um, guidelines and rules that we are setting here or that the board's setting. And I know that um, people have a lot of feelings and emotion and opinions around all of this. But the thing that's really important to know is this district has done what I, I, I believe we've done really well during the pandemic. And we've done really well because we have followed the rules and the guidelines. We're gonna continue to do that. The good news, the, the little ray of sunshine is that next Tuesday, if we are in yellow, um, we will not at high school graduations have to require vaccines or, um, or negative test results as is indicated here. But in all of the ceremonies, there will be masks, there will be screening, and there will be social distancing of six feet or greater. So um, we ask folks to adhere to that so we can keep the pandemic at bay and um, if you have any questions about high school graduations for the public, um, contact your school. As of today, we are still requiring the vaccine and the negative test because that's what is required by California Department of Public Health in a live event of that size. Next slide, please. And then um, we have our key factors slide once again. Community transmission is going to be important to follow. And right now, um, our community transmission level is low. We're hoping that through the 
vaccination process, our herd immunity will continue to increase. We're going to be um, working on the vaccines. We'll be looking to the state for oversight and support. So just as Susan said, um, we're looking for that next round of guidelines on what does school look like this summer? What does school look like in the fall? And um, we're going to give you that information as soon as we get it. Um, I think things are going to be changing, as Susan said, very, very soon now. We're going to be watching the research and trying to understand um, what the future holds for us. And then one thing we are going to be watching for is really, will there be a comprehensive testing program, whether that be in, um, in school in general or perhaps in the winter when the risk of uh, another wave is higher. So we will keep you, board, and the public updated on all of those changes. And with that, um, I will go ahead and open it up to the board for questions or comments. Dr. Maldonado, did you want to make any other comments? No, I just want to thank everyone for understanding that we are working together with public health to ensure its safety for all of us, all in our community and are very excited to support our ceremonies while continuing to maintain our safety protocols. Excellent, thank you. I believe we have a couple public comments on this report. Is that correct, Ms. Trujillo? Correct. Good evening, President Four members of the board. We have two public comments for this item. Beth Grant and Anna Marie. Ms. Trujillo, if I could just mention that we did set a maximum time of two minutes for all public comments for the, to tonight because we have quite a few and so they will have a time limit of two minutes and they were informed of that earlier this afternoon. Okay, go ahead. Yes, that's correct. And I don't see Ms. Beth Grant online, but I will start with Anna Marie and I will loop back. Anna Marie, can you hear us? Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Thank you very much, board. Um, I'm a parent to a child in kindergarten, and I'm coming to you out of deep concern over the continuous restrictions that our children have had to endure since they've gone back to in-person learning. We're now over a year in this health crisis, and we know more now than we did at first. Yet nothing is changing for our kids. We know children are at virtually no risk of COVID. We also know from other states and countries who have done things differently that masking and social distancing in schools did not change the number of cases and that children are not a vector of infection. We've been asking so much of our little ones and I do not know if you fully grasp the repercussions of these restrictions on them. You talk about mental health awareness. The number of children, I repeat, children, now having to deal with depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation and substance abuse, it's alarming. Let me tell you about my five-year-old. Let me tell you what she says about school. She comes to me day after day telling me, Mom, I don't like school because I hate wearing the mask all day. It's hot and I can't breathe. How much longer, Mom? She's in kindergarten. This is her first year of school. She should be excited. She should be looking forward to school. And you failed her. She hates it. A mask is a medical device. It's a medical device that has been authorized under emergency use only. You have no legal right to impose this on my child any longer. I'm her parent. I can make an informed decision for my own child. Make these masks optional and let our kids heal from this trauma. But stop with the mask culture. A mask is not a piece of clothing. It's not a trend. It's not a cultural thing. Mask wearing for long periods of time can have some serious physical side effects. My child has complained of nose dryness and overall discomfort, headaches. She's had nosebleeds and sores in her mouth. We're lucky it's not worse. but. She's never had these issues before. And you know why she's having them now? Because she's breathing in her own waste over and over again, bacteria and fungi for hours on end. And not only that, you're asking them to wear it while exercising. We have another type of health crisis on our hands and you're completely The psychological and emotional toll on our children cannot be ignored. Today, I implore you to do the right thing, to do the job we elected you to do and to protect our children before it's too late. Hi, thank you. Thank you, board. Thank you. Um, our next speaker, Beth Grant, is not online. Mm. That concludes public comment. 
Okay, thank you. Then we'll go forward. I just personally want to uh, thank Dr. Wagenick because we have continuing questions, we have continuing concerns, and every time I forward something to you from a member of the community, your response is immediate and thorough. So I want to thank you. I have one question for you. Uh, whether we're in yellow or orange next week, what percent of capacity is allowed at the promotions and the graduations? Um, is it 67? It's 67% of the capacity of the stadium, the field, wherever it is. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Board members, are there any other questions or comments? Question for Dr. Wagenek. Mm -hmm. And even if we are holding the graduation outside in the stadium, we are to wear masks. Is that correct? Yes. Under current um, California Department of Public Health guidelines, we wear masks and we distance families uh, six feet from other families. Thank you. I just want to say thank you so much for all the work that's going into having the vaccination clinics on site. We know that um, such a huge barrier to actually getting vaccinations is access. Mm -hmm. um, it, certainly there are those that uh, don't agree, but that's, I think, what I've been reading, a smaller minority that those we know now who haven't yet received the vaccine, it's um, a yet another exacerbation of access that existed prior to pan the pandemic mm -hmm. that is just now more exposed, access to health care. Uh, we know that routine vaccinations are actually down Mm -hmm. um, Thirty percent across the country. That's polio, rubella, diphtheria. I checked in with um, Dr. Dan Brennan. He said he doesn't believe that's an issue here, but it's something to be aware of. That um, routine vaccines, in fact, our polio herd immunity is actually threatened right now because so many kids across the country missed their appointments. So mm -hmm. I just want us to be um, to be as forward thinking as possible about what you're doing, which is bringing the vaccine to our families in need. In fact, when I looked into this, um, Dr. Salk uh, in 1954, uh, when he had his first polio vaccine, he actually administered it himself at an elementary school in Pittsburgh to nine-year-olds and rolled up their sleeves and told jokes and mm -hmm. made them feel comfortable and spent two hours in this gymnasium to show that it's safe and also that we need to be not just expecting that the vaccine makes it into the arms of kids, especially those who are struggling financially and socioeconomically. So just love to hear that this is happening. Um, and just want to, again, applaud and also echo the spirit of um, the speaker, while I certainly um, believe that we all should need to be wearing masks and masks have saved countless lives. I do firmly believe that kids have borne the brunt of this pandemic, even though they don't contract the disease at the rates that adults do um, and thankfully don't get as sick or die. Um, what we've seen this last year plus is that they've really carried the weight of this disease, the pandemic, um, and all that they've missed out on. It's a much different scenario for uh, me to have made small sacrifices than um, what so many of our children have made. So they just have those kids on our mind, especially as we're thinking through celebration. So I'll just end by saying I hope we can continue to be as creative and flexible. And if we get to yellow, I hope that means that the graduations can be even a little more free flowing, whatever that might look like, because these kids need to celebrate. They need to know mm -hmm. that we, we, we understand as much as we possibly can um, how much they've been through these past year and a half. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from board members? Well, thank you very much. Then this concludes the COVID-19 report section, and we will return to board comments and correspondence. And I'd like to start tonight with a couple of items. Um, one that has great, uh, greatly concerned me over the past couple of weeks. We know that schools aren't immune to destruction caused by natural disasters, 
even schools in Santa Barbara, and we're definitely not immune to the damage that even Ms. Capps just mentioned, caused by disease or social unrest, economic recession, or wars in distant, distant lands. In the past two weeks, though, I'm so sad to hear about the renewed war in the Middle East between Israel and Palestine, fueled by extremists on both sides, and the loss of lives is so unforgivable and distressing. But just as unforgivable and distressing is the continuing huge rise of violent and hateful anti-Semitism around the world, even in our pretty little paradise of Santa Barbara. And although I don't know about you, but we might not all fully understand the conflict in the Middle East, we cannot stay silent or look the other way in the face of anti-Semitism. And so in the name of peace, and respect and tolerance. Please don't allow anti-Semitism into your lives or into our schools. I think that's the very least that we can do right here at home. And also, I just want to also uh, commend, as Dr. Maldonado did, Dos Pueblos, Clark Sayer, his team, the cast, and the crew for the memorable performance of the Broadway musical Pippin that I attended on Friday evening with other board members. Um, I was impressed with the imaginative staging and the inventive, really brave use of technology, the beautiful, huge backdrop, and also just a, a, the innovative approach to everything, the songs and the script, even the staff was involved. And I love the fresh and youthful touches that were added throughout, like skateboarding and um, break dancing, which showed to me that the students were empowered with their, their voices and their ideas. And as I said last week, theater is back. So uh, now we'll continue with more board comments and correspondence. <laughs> Ms. Munoz. Thank you, President Ford. Um, it was also with great joy that I celebrated the return of the theater with my sister board members that were there on Friday and um, uh, the you know talent of the of the Dos Pueblos, t uh, both the teachers, the staff and the students and just that excitement of getting ready to watch Pippin there in their parking lot and every all the lights and camera and the music. We were singing along, right, Ms. Sims Moten? Um, I also had the opportunity to visit Roosevelt School along with Dr. Maldonado and Principal uh, Gabe Sandoval gave us a great tour, an opportunity to see the students, the kindergartners up to the sixth graders. Cleveland. Oh, I'm sorry, of, <laughs> of Cleveland. Um, I had actually mapped Roosevelt and then <laughs> I went oh. to Cleveland, sorry. Oh, <laughs> um, yes, I, I really enjoyed the tour um, and the diversity of the teachers' backgrounds there both from teachers that were you know, fairly new and from teachers that have been there at the school for many years. Um, the specialized program that they have for children with autism is amazing. Um, we were able to tour both of the classes for that. And I'd also like to give my thanks to Dr. Maldonado for recognizing Mental Health Month in May. Um, it is not until mental health no longer has a stigma and is considered similar to physical illness that we will all be better off. Being a student is stressful, but trying to juggle schoolwork and other responsibilities while experiencing mental illness can make it even harder. I feel that it's beneficial to students to have their mental health support as part an integral part of their education. Uh, the Anxiety and Depression Association of America found that one in eight children are affected by anxiety, yet 80% of those are not receiving treatment. In the words of Glenn Close, what mental health needs is more sunlight, more candor, and more unashamed conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. sims Moton, please. Yes, thank you. Um, I'd like to start out saying it was extraordinary. That's what we were kept hearing at the Pippin, you know, and turn that and we were out there and I so appreciate the students <laughs> and what they were doing. And uh, I wanted, they were out there kind of, it was kind of cold as we started to get out there, you know. And I thought I should have some hot drinks for you or something, but they, they were fine. And it really felt like an outdoor, you know, at the theater, you know, I mean, you know, drive up actually. They had the snack bar, you know, doing that type of thing. And so it was really good. And I really appreciated um, the production and all the work uh, that they that they truly put in. So it truly was extraordinary. Also, I'd like to, um, uh, during the week, we got the opportunity to go on Zoom and uh, look at the uh, 
um, Administrator of the Year uh, in our region, Ms. Sean Carey. So thank you for that. I was, <laughs> I was sharing with her that um, I think she was just coming on as the assistant soup and we were getting, we were boarding in 2016, so we've grown up through a whole lot of things. And so I wanna continue to thank you for hanging in there as we did too, uh, all of those things and so all the hard work. And so it was great to see you be honored for the work that you do and I know that you, that you love, so appreciate that. Also had the opportunity to to also attend a Zoom meeting with the Santa Barbara Education Foundation, and I want to first thank them for just always supporting this district in every way we ask and request, and they go out and they really try to do it and making sure that our students have what they need. When we, when there's a gap, they are there to fill it. So I want to acknowledge that appreciation for the work that they do as a board. And we also we had a meet and greet with Fran. Fran, thank you so much for that. Um, presentation about mental health. We're talking about that quite a bit now. And so it's something that the students are saying, the community is saying, and it was a great presentation to look at the things that we're doing. And we realized that in order for us to get more mentally healthy, we have to look at this as a community with regards to that. So I want us to continue to look at that and talking to our students, what their experience, what they would like um, in terms of you know, the, the mental health support that they need. It may be large, it may be small, but we just wanna make sure that nothing gets loose, lost in there. So I really appreciate your um, presentation. And lastly, I'd like to share that I got promoted to principal. Um, I have a staff member who has two kids who have been uh, in uh, remote learning for quite some time and they probably had just had enough, you know. And so they just told her that uh, we're just gonna call Miss Wendy. And so, uh, which requires some, some discipline to her. And so I just want Isaac and Marissa to know that I did have a talk with your mom. I think everything's gonna be okay. You continue to work hard. <laughs> Summer's almost here. So I just, you know, it's important that they're struggling and they're also watching, they're figuring out, we're just gonna send you to the principal's office because you're not behaving. So I just wanted to share with them that everything's okay and they can need to continue to work hard. Summer is almost here, so thank you. Very sweet. Uh, thank you, and Ms. Caps, please. Thank you. I'd just like to uh, take a minute to pay tribute uh, to Hal Conklin, um, who passed away um, just a few days ago. He was a dear, dear family friend, but more importantly, um, a major, major influence on this city, having served uh, in so many uh, ways, uh, but most, perhaps most notably as on the city council and mayor for 17 years. And there's two things that our city was not known for prior to Hal's service. We were not yet known as the place of Earth Day, but he thankfully founded the Community Environmental Council and served as its first co-executive director and really brought that sense of environmentalism. I say it's in our DNA here, uh, in large part thanks to Hal Conklin's leadership. And also we were not yet really known as an art center. And he um, just, it was so passionate about the arts, about the theater, uh, the Granada. He ushered in the State Street's um, focus on the arts, and I think about the connection to our school and how much that fosters a sense of connection with one another, especially now as you're talking about Pippin and the fact that we can all come together. It just makes me think of Hal's spirit because he really was all about bringing people together and making sure that the institutions, as fundamental as democracy, are working because he was hopeful and optimistic about those institutions until the day he died. And I just um, wanted to share what a significant person he was personally in my life, but also to this entire community. And I hope that um, that spirit, I believe that spirit will, will live on. Um, speaking of the arts, I. Uh, Wanted to thank Mr. Larson's class at um, Adams Elementary. Ms. Escobedo and I, got, we were invited to go listen to some xylophone and we did. It was sort of like a meditative session. I didn't quite wanna leave. Thanks to Principal Kelly Fresh for being there as well. But again, just our kids are now performing and playing music together and it warms my heart. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Caps. And Ms. Alvarez, please. Well, I was also at Pimpin. I was not singing less with like Ms. Sims Moton. I was applauding, but it was a wonderful <laughs> production. And uh, thank you to Mr. Sayer and everyone who helped put that together. And also, Dr. Wagonek, thank you so much for your leadership um, 
the communication when that fire broke out last week and at night and early in the morning. So thank you for taking care of our families and our staff really appreciate the work that everyone puts uh, into that effort. And also um, Dr. Maldonado and I had a meeting today. We were discussing the governor's pro budget proposal and its possible impacts to community funded schools such as Santa Barbara Unified. We are uh, planning a meeting tomorrow, a Zoom meeting with the representative Senator Limon and her staff members. And most likely we will also be having meetings with uh, Mr. Bennett as well, Steve Bennett, but we will be keeping you informed of our progress. And uh, thank you, Dr. Maldonado for all your work on behalf of that as well. Thank you. And finally, before we go on, congratulations are in order. Tonight, it's my honor to announce one certificated retirement. Amy Matthews, a teacher at La Colina Junior High School, retires next month after over four years of employment in the district. We wish her good health and a much deserved retirement filled with new adventures, fun, and of course, some rest. And I also wanted to congratulate Sean Carey uh, since our last meeting, because on May 14th, she was honored as the Central Office Administrator of the Year. And I will say that uh, although there have been many at times when Zoom meetings have uh, been an issue or difficult for us. The fact that the celebration was on Zoom, I'm not sure if you know, Sean, but there were so many chat comments about how much people appreciate you, admire you, and are inspired by you. So uh, that was a good thing about Zoom and congratulations. And at this time, we go on to item number eight, which is the opportunity for comments from the public about items that are not on the agenda for this evening. I do want to inform you that because of the number of public comments again, tonight, the meeting, um, throughout this meeting, they are going to be limited to two minutes each. And as I said, they were informed of this earlier this evening. So Ms. Trujillo, could you please introduce the public comments for agenda items, uh, for items not on the agenda? Thanks. Thank you, President Ford. We have 14 speakers for this item. I will call five names at a time so speakers can get ready. Our first five are Connie Alexander, Dr. Hisu Witten, Roseanne Crawford, Nina Daughtery, and Kay Taylor Nang. I'll we'll start with Connie Alexander. Ah, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, May 25th, it brings uh, a somber note nationally, internationally, as we remember the murder of George Floyd. And my mind also is around uh, where are we with so many things that the African American and Black students asked for last year? And so, you know, I want to bring to your attention and think about where, where are we with those things? And although you don't hear regularly African-American community coming on, just know that we are listening and I am listening to see and to hear progress. You know, um, you know I, I think about things like this time last year, we didn't know that if there were any black students in peak and I'm still wondering, you know, are there any black students in peak? How are we doing with the enrollment in the specialty academies? You know, how are the BSUs being supported? How are you working with black organizations in the community? And please know that there's more than one. Uh, you know, the report on the hiring recently sounded non-existent and it was extremely disappointing to hear there have not been progress in that regard. And I know that our students really would like to hear this. And so in that vein, how do we keep this from saying or looking at or being a place where not all feel that same sense of belonging, that same sense that we matter, that these students matter. We would like to hear it from more than one board member. We would like to hear it from everyone. Where are you? Can we hear from you? Where's the emphasis here? So I just wanna remind you that although we don't, and I know there's gonna be a whole trail behind me tonight, spewing the same things that they usually come on and say every couple of weeks, but just know that there are the rest of us that are here and Hi, we do know these students matter. Thank, Thank you. you. 
Next, we have Dr. Hisu Witten. Good evening. I wanted to talk about uh, the COVID vaccines and children. Um, as you know, all medicine comes down to risk versus benefits. The child COVID survival rate is 99.997, better than flu. So even if the vaccine worked like a charm, it would save no one. Kids have basically zero chance of dying from COVID. So any vaccine risk is too great. Data shows kids also don't spread COVID to adults. And in the rare instance of a serious illness, there are extremely effective treatments. Um, Oxford University did a study on budesonide, which is an asthma inhaler, and found that 90% of hospitalizations and deaths could have been avoided with this medication alone. Also, the vaccine's already been tied to over 4,300 reports of death in the US alone. And a study by Harvard Pilgrim HMO showed that less than 1% of adverse re reactions are ever reported. So the real figure could be 100 times that. Data now shows this vaccine is 60 times deadlier than all other vaccines combined. So to coerce children who have no risk of COVID to take this is beyond child abuse. The misleading stat that the vaccine is 95% effective is based on relative risk reduction. According to the medical journal Lancet, that stat only applies to subjects in a research trial. In the real world where not everyone will catch COVID, absolute risk reduction is the relevant uh, metric for the general public. And the absolute risk reduction is 1.2% for Moderna and 0.84% for Pfizer. So basically 1% risk reduction and the vaccine doesn't even prevent transmission. So it gets us no closer to herd immunity. Why anyone would consider Time. trampling our rights for this medical experiment with no Time. benefit Thank you. is beyond me. Thank you. Next we have Roseanne Crawford. Hi, sound test, please. Yes, go ahead. Thank you, good evening. Putting aside the questionable use of LCAP budget funds for a school-wide dual language immersion program at McKinley, whether you believe this is the best way to teach dual or whether you believe it's the best way to teach dual language immersion, let's take a human look at what's going on at this public school. This neighborhood school is being torn apart at the seams. Recently, seven more teachers and staff are leaving. The deaf and hearing program is being moved off campus. Incoming parents, some having younger siblings already established in all English, don't want to participate in the dual bilingual program, and they don't have a choice except to leave their neighborhood school. Morale is at a low time, all time low. This is a neighborhood school with the attendance boundary and no busing. Will you be changing the attendance boundary for this neighborhood school to accommodate balancing the classes with 50% English speakers? Sometimes things look one way on paper, and when you try to implement them, it's messy or simply doesn't work as planned. Is the collateral damage worth it in converting McKinley to an all dual language immersion school? It doesn't have to be this way. This was formed and presented in 2019 as a concept and then voted in by this board in the middle of COVID lockdown in March of 21 of this year. The stakeholders, an insular group of staff, teachers, board members, and Adelante supporters are not the true stakeholders. The true stakeholders are the McKinley parents just recently finding out about this. Outreach has failed to this school and there's been little transparency and inter lots of interchangeable Phrases such as META and DLI, they're not even sure if it's the same program. Well, many families think the new principals brought this change in. No wonder she's so disliked by the families and staff. She didn't bring this to the school wide as a program. The administration has. Dr. Garcia came from Soria Elementary School in Oxnard that offered both DLI and English. It's done well there. It can be done here. Thank Hi. you. You bring this community together. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nina. Daughtery. Daughtery, can you unmute yourself?
Ms. Daughtery, can you hear us? Um, she's not responding, so I'm gonna go ahead and go to our next speaker, Kay Taylor. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, one of our members, Nina, got food poisoning, who was supposed to speak before me. Um, so I will be reading both her speech and my speech. Um, my name is Kay Taylor Ng, and I am an eighth grader at Goleta Valley Junior High. My peers and I will be addressing the issue about the dress code. The section we are concerned about states, students shall wear clothing that fits properly and which does not expose the torso or undergarments. This primarily targets girls by telling them they need to cover up at school to keep from being a distraction. This rule creates an unfair power dynamic, giving boys power to control how girls dress. Many boys rock, walk around school wearing their pants sagging down to their knees with undergarments visible, but I've never once seen a boy get dress coded for showing boxer shorts. Also, regulating girls' clothing promotes negative body image and slut shaming. We understand that the point of the dress code is to make sure that students are safe and focused. We created a survey asking students, male and female, if they specifically found bra straps and torsos distracting. 92% no. 8% said yes, but only when teachers made a big deal out of it in class. There have also been issues with teachers dress coding students in ways that make students feel uncomfortable. The dress code says that teachers should not address students in front of the class or pull them out during the middle of class, but teachers still do this. It is embarrassing for the student and it is distracting to the class, negatively impacting their learning. Also, since mostly girls are being dress coded and pulled out of class, it makes us feel like our education is less important than the boys. We created a Google form that anyone could fill out to share their stories and experiences with sexism. We received 150 responses showing students feeling targeted by administrators. There are too many of stories still, <laughs> too many of these stories telling, describing teachers making students feel uncomfortable and dress coding them in a way that is not appropriate. Our next issue is that we have noticed that girls would get targeted because they have bigger breasts or curvier bodies. The dress code should be applied equitably and teens, especially girls, should not be punished for something they can't control like their body shape. Lastly, teachers are targeting certain kids and making assumptions based on race. For example, assuming that certain teens are affiliated with gangs based of the based on their race. I understand that gang-related clothing should not be allowed at schools, but things like bandanas and certain colors should not be forbidden to wear at school. In conclusion, I believe that although there should be some sort of structure for the dress code, there definitely needs to be a change to the current one and the way it's applied. Thank you. Thank you. I'll name our next five speakers. Amelia Vander May, Asha Tagna, Marina Sarate. Leslie Sanderson, Elrod McLearn. I'll go with Amelia Vandermeer. Hi, I am Amelia Vandermeer and I'm also an eighth grader at GV and part of the dress code group. Uh, so we've shared how people are feeling and what's happening and now we'd like to propose a plan. Uh, to ensure the dress code isn't targeting certain types of people, we suggest the data of everyone who's been dress coded be reviewed at the end of every year in every school. The data should be checked for disproportionate numbers of certain genders, races, social classes, body types, and other recurring patterns. If you find that a group of people is being targeted, the school staff should be informed and the situation addressed. As for the dress code itself, we understand that most of the rules are for our safety, but we believe that shouldn't, students shouldn't be dress coded for showing their bra straps or torso, because neither a bra strap nor a stomach is in any way harming or distracting anyone. If for some reason a student is distracted, the teacher or administrator can move that person to another seat where they can maintain focus. It should be the district's responsibility to teach kids how to be respectful and not sexualize each other's bodies. If students being distracted by a bra strap is a concern, you should find a way to incorporate teaching students how to treat others with equality and respect rather than teaching them to hide their bodies. We propose that you change the rule to something along the lines of doesn't expose the chest area or underwear instead of torso and undergarments. The dress code actually already has rules articulating the appropriate way for staff to dress code a student, but we have noticed that this isn't being enforced. The way teachers are calling out students for showing their shoulders or stomachs makes students uncomfortable and encourages slut shaming. School staff should be given guidelines and find appropriate ways to dress code a student, such as pulling them aside after class or leaving them a note. 
rather than asking them to leave in, fr in front of the whole class, calling them names such as slutty or forcing them to alter their attire, like yanking someone's shirt down as someone shared in our stories. We're open to having conversations with you and working on a plan together, but we all firmly believe that something needs to change. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Asher Takna. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi, my name is Asher Takna, and I'm going to be talking about the health curriculum and what needs to change about it. And so I just noticed that the first thing is why are male and female students being separated with having talks about puberty and sex ed? This shouldn't happen because the literal only difference is one having a penis and one having a vagina. These are, that's the only difference and mentally it shouldn't work like that. Having it split up is saying to most students that you should not be associating with people of the opposite sex or being, sorry, or talking about this is a bad thing. I understand that it may be embarrassing to talk about sex ed with both sexes in the same room, but there should be a way that everyone talks about it because it's a natural thing. It's something that's happened for years. And I, I strongly suggest that what happens to it is everything is in person in the same room talking about the same thing. Thank you. I think your next speaker is Marina Sarate. Um, buenas tardes. Sandra, mi comentario va a ser en español. Sí, perfecto. Puede continuar. Gracias. Buenas tardes, miembros del consejo, superintendente Maldonado. Mi nombre es Marina Zárate y soy una de las copresidentas del comité ejecutivo de DILAC. Mi comentario es esta, ta esta tarde es uno que hubiera deseado nunca presentar ante ustedes. Estoy aquí para denunciar el acoso telefónico que nuestra compañera Manuela Fierros sufrió hace dos semanas antes de dar su presentación ante el consejo escolar con las recomendaciones de nuestro comité. Manuela recibió no una, sino cinco llamadas de personas que la acusaban de arruinar la vida de familias y estudiantes por la implementación del programa de doble inmersión en la escuela McKinley. Estas personas le pidieron no hacer la presentación y no ser partícipe de ella, argumentando que ella no sabía el daño que le estaba causando a la comunidad de la escuela McKinley. Se le sugirió cambiar su presentación para hablar en contra de Meta. Se le ofreció una reunión para entrenarla y prepararla para desprestigiar Meta ante el consejo y todos los asistentes, lo que me parece una monstruosidad, porque eso solo nos confirma que nuestra comunidad está siendo silenciada utilizada y manipulada por ciertos grupos de nuestra comunidad a los que les preocupa la participación e involucramiento de nuestras familias en el sistema escolar en los últimos años. Lo más preocupante de esta situación es que Manuela fue asignada el día anterior para hacer la presentación, por lo que solo algunas personas del distrito escolar y nosotros sabíamos de ello. El hecho de que el número de teléfono personal de Manuela haya sido compartido con diferentes personas para hacerle llamadas es preocupante. Las personas que se esconden de una llamada o repartiendo volantes en las escuelas sin mencionar sus nombres o dar la cara no son fuentes confiables. Padres, por favor no se presten a hacer este tipo de llamadas. La intimidación es un delito y puede denunciarse y castigarse como tal. Gracias por su tiempo. Gracias. Our next speaker is Leslie Sanderson. Ms. Sanderson, can you hear us? Uh, yes. Yeah, go ahead. Um, hello, board and Dr. Maldonado. I just wanted to make a comment regarding the significant amount of funds that will be available for our district under the American Rescue Plan funds. It is my understanding that the district um, will be able to receive all the funds and that state plans or district plans must be developed with input from stakeholders and published. I have not yet seen an agenda item or any type of plan for these funds. 
um, a big portion of this is, um, a chunk of it is going to special education uh, funding. I had sent the board an email in April about my impressions of the current state of the adult transition programs for moderate to severe students with disabilities and the need for determining a site for some programs, supporting programs with specific, sp specified evidence-based curriculum training and staff. With the amount of funds earmarked for special education, a program can be developed and staff training completed from the ground up. Examples of some of the successful programs I were provided in that email. In addition to this, having a son in the district receiving special education services for 12 years now, there are multiple areas which could use significant funding and work, including but not limited to intensive evidence-based multisensory reading program instruction um, and materials, possibly a school-based dyslexia center, school district-based assistive technology staff, materials and support, and school-wide positive behavior support systems, instruction and support with an emphasis on inclusive education for those with disabilities, transition assessment and planning instruction for teachers on meaningful goals for those with disabilities, among others. I would suggest that the district and the board consider suggestions and input from all stakeholders, not just from those groups that are directed and guided by district staff. We have the unique opportunity now to improve the services and outcomes for those students with disabilities with the most needs and those that have been most affected by the learning loss during the pandemic. Please consider input, making a plan, including all stakeholders, publishing a plan and making use of these funds in an open and transparent way. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Elrod McLearn. Hello. Go ahead. Hello. Yes, can you, you can go ahead. Uh, so businesses are reopened. People are gathering in groups and movie theaters, churches, restaurants, and weddings, and children are back in school, which I think all those things are awesome. But it causes me to question, why are we still having board meetings over Zoom? What is the reason for that? Uh, you know, also, as we just heard from Susan Rothschild, the case numbers are low. They're also dropping. We're going to be able to hear soon. So are we saying, or is the thought of this board that wearing, distancing, and scenes aren't going to protect us if we gather in person for a board meeting. When people are gathering in churches, in restaurants, in other venues in person. Or is it maybe, in my mind, it might be a fear of interacting with the public. The last meeting that happened before all this pandemic uh, shut down our board meetings and moved us onto Zoom was met with over 200 community members and it was a very uh, active meeting and I feel like the board is either trying to prevent that interaction with the public or they do not believe in the science. The science says we can gather together. Science says we can meet and distance and we can do all this but we're not doing it. You know it really hurts me to see or to not be able to see the speakers come to these meetings, who they talk, but I don't know who they are. I can't see their face. When I talk to you guys, I don't have any connection. There's no interpersonal connection. I can't look into anyone's eyes. There's none of that. All we do is we talk to a screen and that is harmful. And it doesn't allow us to actually interact with the board members, nor can we get the sense that we're being heard. So. As I said, everything else is opening. Thank Why are we not opening? If there's a will, there's a way. We could use the high school auditorium, for example, to hold. Time. Thank you. Our next four speakers are Moni Duet, Victor Carmona, Rene Correa, Justin Shores. We begin with Moni Duet. Yes, thank you, Sandra, so much. And um, yes. all right, I will um, try to be brief. I know you have a long night, but um, yes, I am on the LCAP committee. And um, again, I guess what I wanted the board to know is that um, it was very difficult to participate. The structure of the meeting, again, was focused by the staff where we spent the beginning of the meeting 
just knowing how that pool of money came to be. And it was really not relevant for most of us. We just want to know how we're going to spend it. And so we have gotten a budget, but also the goals of the budget were all written up by staff. And they're really not, in my mind, I'm not sure they're fully reflective of all the needs um, of these very vulnerable students. And some of the language is a little hard to read, not accessible. Like the, the first uh, goal is to um, have outcomes through cultural and linguistically sustaining organizational transformation. And that seems very general. Like one of the things that I'm concerned about for this group is that their literacy and math scores are particularly low. And so I would like to see more paraeducators. I would like to see reading interventionists. And I'd like to see what we're going to do campus wide so that I can be sure that the students who are doing the worst, the most vulnerable at McKinley, Cleveland, Monroe, Harding, Franklin, and Adams, according to the data, that we are sure we're meeting those needs. And from the agenda and the budget I got is we have things like um, teacher salaries and engagement people's salaries, and it's not going directly to the kids in the most effective way. And I also feel that we really weren't given a meaningful opportunity to participate. So I just really want the board to perhaps they could just send out a survey to ask everybody. I saw people who dropped out. Time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nuestra siguiente participante <laughs> es Victor Carmona. Señor Carmona, ¿nos puede escuchar? Sí, aquí estoy. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Eh, Buenas tardes, miembros del Consejo. Mi nombre es Víctor Carmona. Hoy me gustaría hablar acerca del Plan Meta, que sin duda este plan viene acompañado de muchos beneficios en diferentes áreas como la académica, cultural, económica, de salud. Pero sin duda viene acompañado de, de obstáculos por parte de uno o varios grupos que sin argumentos confiables se dedican a compartir información que no es correcta o información sumamente incompleta. En días pasados comprobamos que este grupo se vale inclusive de la intimidación para poder lograr su objetivo. En mi opinión, muchos padres de familia luchamos que se eliminen ciertas malas opiniones acerca de nuestra comunidad que, que hablan otro idioma que no es el inglés. Yo en mi última participación en los comentarios públicos hablaba de las pocas expectativas de nuestros alumnos por parte de algunos miembros que trabajan en este distrito. En un volante que se circula en una de nuestras escuelas, invita a las familias a no participar en el programa de no doble inmersión lingüística. En mi opinión, demerita la capacidad de muchos de los estudiantes con capacidad de ser multilingües y con un futuro brillante que no solo es el multilingüismo, sino en todas las áreas en general. Esta uh, práctica de golpeteo sistemática de poca expectativa hacia nuestros hijos no es nueva. De acuerdo con la ideología de este grupo, ser competentes en el idioma inglés es el objetivo, sin proponer o proveer opciones a nuevos programas de apoyo o con una respuesta mejor que el plan meta. Para esas personas les aconsejo que por favor dejen a los padres tomar decisiones por ellos mismos. Finalmente, y los invito o invito a todas las personas a ser más honestos con la información que se proporciona a todos los grupos de personas que están interesados en este o que no están interesados y puedan hacer sus deducciones por ellos mismos sin la presión Tiempo. y sin, y sin este ser eh, presionados por otros. Muchas gracias. gracias. The next speaker is René Correa, but I don't see him online, so I'm going to go to just, Justin Shores and go back to see if Mr. Correa joins the meeting. Justin Shores. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Thank you, members of the board. Um, all, over the last year, we've heard you state that you're following the, the California health guidelines. And looking at the, the data and the, the, the map, um, there's just to give one example, there's currently only three states require masks fully um, with fully vaccinated people. So it looks more like it's political science than science because we're not seeing um, the, the actual science 
um, across the board. Um, and that's what I felt like it's been all year. So what if you're wrong? Um, what if they're wrong? We need you to put our children's health first, their mental, their physical health. That's, that's important. And we can't go to them. We can't go to the California board to complain. We can only go to you. And you need to be our advocates. So, so just my example, I heard a story from a teacher who saw a young girl just burst into tears because she dropped her mask because she thought she would get COVID and die. So just think of all the little kids, all the things that you're, you're putting in their brain right now that they can't critically think of that you're supposed to do for them. You're supposed to help them. Um, there's a new story by Mark Zuckerberg that is based on uh, data from Florida, New York, and Massachusetts that shows that kid, more kids in schools is associated with lower COVID rates and requiring masks in schools made no difference. So you have you said all year you're following these guidelines, but we don't see you reacting to the, the real science. You need to be our advocates. You need to be protecting our children. And it's, it's very important that you are critical, that you're critical of these guidelines and you just don't just put mandates. So we ask at least, at the very least, that you make all COVID regulations mandatory, or not mandatory, you make optional. You let parents decide. Some parents may want to send their kids with masks, some may not. Let them choose. Time. Thank you. Mr. Correa is still not online, so that concludes public comment on this item. You're laying up there. Um, Okay, thank you so much. Since it's 8.07, I would like to go to our next time certain report, which is the Summer of Learning, report number seven. Turn it over to Ms. Luffridge and Ms. Roundy Harder. Good evening, board. I was just waiting to be promoted to a panelist. I'm so glad to be with you tonight to be able to share a quick update on our summer of learning, along with my partner, uh, Sierra Lockridge. So next slide, please. As always, we ground our work in the superintendent's goals, which help to guide and focus our work around equity for students. And that's a big part of our work with summer of learning, that it touches on many of the pieces that you see in this by now familiar graphic. Next slide. We're very thrilled to tell you that we have many students that have been invited. As you can see here, we see children smiling and that's exactly what we hope to see in our uh, summer school experiences here from our little itty bitty kiddos in the preschool program all the way up through 12th graders who are earning credits back to be A to G eligible. So you can see on this slide uh, that we have over 3,700 students total who have been invited into one of many summer learning experiences that we're offering June through August. I'll give you just a second to absorb those numbers. In particular, I would just like to highlight that we haven't really talked about the preschool space before, but we are just delighted that we have our little ones um, able to access these programs as well. Okay, next slide, please. Going quickly in acknowledgement of a long agenda tonight. We're also really delighted to share with you that since our last board meeting, we have been busily actively hiring many people for our summer school programs, including our six elementary summer school coordinators. So these are uh, teachers who have administrative credentials who will be uh, running the programs um, and working closely with both Sierra and with uh, Assistant Superintendent Ana Escobedo as, as principals at the sites to coordinate those programs. We have over 200 um, teachers that we have been able to hire, including, as I mentioned before, preschool teachers. We've been hiring nurses, speech language pathologists, paraeducators, counselors, and other classified staff members. And so we're just um, thrilled we're getting really close to being where we need to be, although some numbers are still coming in there. Next slide, please. Additionally, it's really important to us that we think about the total health of our students. I'm wearing my green to support uh, mental health as well as thinking about the physical health of our students. So we often think about summer school purely from an academic standpoint, 
But as we know, we really need to make sure that we're reaching all the needs of the child, including uh, safety, including uh, wellness of their bodies too. And so we wanna thank Matt Dittman and his amazing staff. Um, they anticipate serving over 250,000 meals this summer um, to make sure that our children are nourished so that their brains are well fed so they can learn all those great things they need to, to be ready for the next school year. So at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Ms. Lockridge. Thank you, Dr. Randy Harder. Good evening, President Ford, board member, superintendent, Dr. Maldonado and our, our community. Not only will we be feeding um, the students, but we will be moving our students to go explore uh, their community and also to make sure that they get to school uh, safe and sound. So in elementary, we will have bus routes um, because Adam's students will be going over to SBCA and SBCA will be the host site for that school. And so the bus route will be on the approved bus route stops. And I'm working with um, Kathy over at STA uh, to establish that. We're actually meeting tomorrow when she gets back from a, a graduation for her family. Uh, likewise, Monroe will be going to Harding since they have construction at their site. So we'll get them there and back. Roosevelt has a bus route um, and Washington students will have the same bus route, but instead of stopping at Washington, we'll go over to McKinley. And of course, our extended school year also has bus routes um, based on those students' needs and IEPs. Additionally, we are very fortunate to partner with them for field trips and some of the exciting field trips that our elementary students get to go to because of the amazing partnerships are Camp Whittier up on the 154, the Moxie, the Condor Express, um, the Watershed Resource Center, um, and uh, the Public Library. So we are very excited about that. Additionally, secondary students will get to school safe and sound as well and through the partnership with uh, MTD. Um, and there will be the one best route for Goleta Valley Lock and La Colina and DP and San Marcos. Next slide. So um, busing, food, teaching staff, all of these things, instructional materials um, are adding up to a wonderful opportunity for 3,700 students uh, for four, 14 to thir almost 30 days of instruction. Uh, the cost is $3,521,000 um, and we have everyone included from preschool to elementary to junior high, newcomers, high school students, um, bridge programs to get them ready for the next level. So it is a comprehensive and robust um, and in engaging and ambitious summer school program. Next slide. Additionally, we are also planning to support our teachers. Uh, this year, our Summer Institute's theme is equity in action our students, our future. And uh, to make this happen, we have thought very strategically about the superintendent focus, um, that, that infographic you saw at the beginning that really has become our anchor. And as such, each day has a strategic theme. On Monday, we will be educating the whole student, really looking at whole child. And we have UCSB's own Dr. Victor Rios as our keynote speaker. On Tuesday, we will be looking at how we can be responsive educators. And we have Dr. David Duncan Andrade, who started us off at the beginning of this year um, with very inspirational um, and a, a compelling charge. On Wednesday, it's all about teaching and learning, inclusive teaching and learning. And Dr. Nancy Fry will be here with us to help us look at the standards and ensure that we are are meeting the students' needs across the board. On Thursday, we get deeper into our equity work with equitable grading and Joe Feldman, who you all heard um, at a board study session recently, um, and there's sessions for elementary and high school on that, that match. And Friday, we look at our family and our community and how we can engage with them with Dr. Karen Mapp as our keynote and a variety of supporting the sessions throughout the day on how to, to do that in ways that are inclusive, respectful, and empowering. Next slide. Um, so the course catalog has gone out. We are still taking registrations. Um, as of right now, I think we have 450, 
D4, so a couple more have come in. Um, and there are five days of, of learning to be had, over 194 sessions. That's about 38 a day um, for each of the different categories. So for example, just on the on Monday, there's 29 different sessions. On Tuesdays, there's 37. And of course, whenever we talk about teaching and learning, we have more to say. Uh, Wednesday, there's 56, and Thursday, 41, and Friday, 31 sessions. And our educators are enrolling now via Google Form, and the amazing Brian Rouse will turn that into a, a schedule, just like the students get, so that educators can come. And these are teachers, um, speech and language pathologists, counselors, all the certificated educators can come and learn about these themes and really see the connection of our initiatives so that they understand why we're focusing on MTSS, why Meta matters, why we are being strategic about language and literacy. Um, and we are just really excited to welcome all of those collaborative learners uh, to San Marcos High School. It is in person with um, some presenters zooming in, but we are planning to be in person um, to really set that stage. And I believe that's the last slide. So we will turn it over to you board for uh, questions and public comments. Wow, thank you. We asked for data and you brought it to us. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to public comment. I believe we have some comments. Ms. Trujillo. That's great. We have two public comment on this item, Ms. Roseanne Crawford and Moni Duet. I will start with Roseanne. Ms. Crawford, can you hear us? Sorry, here I am. Are you there? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Nice presentation. Um, I just want to make the comment that um, to me, that's why I spoke about this last time on May the 10th, there was an interdistrict uh, memo that asked for a short list from the teachers with a limit of students that could be recommended for summer school. Um, I hope to assume that the number that originally was proposed was increased by at least a thousand, which <laughs> through the grapevine, it looks like it might have. I, I know you can't answer back to me, but that was my concern in expressing my concern about that uh, because I, I was commenting on the limit of students that you know were invited for summer school. It also stated that classes would be combined to get a 15 plus three limit. This is not inclusive. This was not the robust summer program that was advertised and discussed in the meeting, but it looks like you've been able to bring it up. So I think that's great, but I'm just wondering how many people out there wanted to go that couldn't. Um, it did not show initially good planning or funding set aside for the summer school it was kind of scrambling, kind of almost an afterthought at the late date. None of the detail about the limit was discussed in the board meeting. This initial plan developed by staff lacked transparency early on. I appreciate you giving us more details tonight, uh, not only to parents in the district, but also school board, principals, and teachers. Uh, it looked frankly kind of sloppy and heavy handed, but this is looking much better tonight. And I'm hoping that you can extend a hand to any others that would like to uh, go to summer school or if you only are sticking with the invitation only. We need a summer school invitation for all. The money is there. Um, let's use it for what it, it's intended for. And thank you so much. I know you care. Thank you. Our next speaker is Moni Duet. Um, yeah, thank you, Sandra. And hi again, board. So um, I am glad that you're offering summer school, but I. My questions are that um, when I look at special ed, uh, I only see 316 in the entire elementary school. And when I look at the scores of five campuses, Cleveland, Harding, Monroe, and Franklin, um, I guess what I would really like is if our English language learners or emergent language learners and our special ed students and our foster youth on those campuses in particular were offered the option because like we know COVID hit some people harder than others and not all students learn the same way. For many students, 
with differences as well as those who struggle with literacy, Zoom meetings are um, not that easy. And so, and plus I think you're offering a lot of enrichment, but we are we do have extra money. And I, I think even some of the LCAP money could go to some of these groups getting summer school. So I just wonder if you could look again and maybe even, I hate to say it, but um, like if we can do the workshops and things, if we could just realign it to our most vulnerable students because they need a break and they're so far behind even before COVID happened. So please consider that. Thank you so much. Thank you. And that concludes public comment on this item. Great. Board members, do you have any comments? Ms. Alvarez. Yes, uh, thank you for that thorough presentation and for all your work to make this happen. I have uh, just a couple of, uh, I think, small questions. Uh, the outreach to incoming seventh graders, I, I'm, I'm sure the outreach there for Santa Barbara Unified Schools. I'm wondering about outreach to feeder schools for elementary schools outside of the district that for incoming seventh graders, is that in place or would you, would you explain how that's taking place? Uh, I can speak to the data portion of that. We have a data um, sharing MOU with our feeder districts from the elementary to the junior highs. And we were able to uh, have that information for students to be able to see uh, where they were of need as well as our students. So um, that is helping to inform uh, the outreach efforts uh, to our sixth grade students in particular, I think is what you're asking about. So do we have students, incoming seventh graders from other districts besides SB Unified that it will be participating in summer school? Yes, I believe so. I don't have numbers for you, but I can try and go get those by okay. our next meeting. Fine, thank you. And then um, I had a, another question. Have any of the students that have been invited declined the offer to participate in summer school? Is that a big percentage, if any? I don't know that information. I would need to ask the summer school coordinators. We've been focusing on uh, doing the invitations and the outreach more than uh, who's not coming, but I can certainly uh, ask the summer school coordinators to provide that information. Thank you. I, I'd be interested in finding out the reason why they're not coming. Maybe we can convince them to show up. Sometimes there's uh, circumstances that we might be able to help those students and they'll come. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Caps. Thank you. I'm just thinking back to months ago when we started, at least at the board level, you probably were way ahead of us, um, really pushing for as much of a robust and rigorous summer school plan. And it felt so daunting because at the time, if I recall, our numbers were very bad in terms of cases and we were not even open yet uh, to hybrid. And it just, again, felt like another huge uh, mountain to climb on top of the mountains we were climbing. So I just want to give my heartfelt congratulations for where we are. And if I had known then uh, that we'd be offering positions, uh, summer school invitations to nearly a third of our student population, that is that is the, the definition of a robust summer school plan. So uh, thank you so much. And I'm just again, it looks seamless and like this always was in the works, but uh, we need to step back and remember that summer school, at least in the elementary grades and younger, it has not been a significant part of what this district uh, did. And this is our future, perhaps, and I'm just excited by the path that we're on. Thank you. Ms. Sims Moten. Yes, I just want to echo my sister board members. Thank you for this very um, detailed report and upgraded report. And you know, I'm especially excited about preschool, so thank you. Um, and also, I also want to appreciate you taking into consideration our comments with regards to could we expand it a little bit more. So I noticed that we did that. I just want to really express my appreciation for for doing exactly what we were asking, and know that it's again you're you're, you're kind of doing this as you're going, but it's it's a great, and I'm looking forward to it. And again. I'm hoping that I can get on some of those field trips. So, um, but thank you. And Ms. Munoz, please. Yes, I also agree with my sister board members. Um, thank you so much to all for all the hard work behind the scenes, um, the transportation for our students, the lunches, 
the um, field trips, I had to read the uh, list twice and go, whoa, <laughs> those are really nice. A very, you know, just like, as I said, just a very robust um, schedule and all the offerings include, and then also the equity in action, um, great, you know, great presentations that are gonna be available to our teachers and the speakers and so forth. Very excited about this and thank you so much to all. And I'll just conclude also with my gratitude, um, the excitement, the passion that has gone into the planning. I think all of you should be very proud. And I know, Ms. Escobedo, you are working on those t-shirts. <laughs> S-O-L, El Sol. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. And with that, it's 8.25, and I'd like to move to the consent agenda. Um, see if we can get that done before we take our break. Um, remember that the consent agenda is an opportunity to approve items that are routine and do not require much, if any, discussion. And they have been recommended for approval by the superintendent and staff. And the board has had opportunity to consider and ask questions about these items before tonight. So, Ms. Trujillo, I believe we have some public comments on the consent agenda. That's correct. We have three speakers on item Four, approval of ally to compliance accomplice contract. Thank and you. Please go ahead. Lauren Quadet, Kim Pasquez, and Cressida Silvers. Lauren Quadet. Hello. Um, my name is Lauren Quande, and I am a future parent and also an alumni of this district. I am speaking today in support of this agenda item to bring DEI training to key educators and district staff. I'm in favor of any efforts by this district to educate their teachers and all staff members as to current and historical inequities, our personal and institutional biases, and the implications of these in our classrooms, and most importantly, the way this affects our students' futures. This kind of training will benefit all of our students, regardless of their race. I have participated myself in several different DEI trainings, including training led by Ally to Accomplice. In my experience, these training sessions have been non-political, non-partisan. They are invitational, welcoming, and inclusive of all people. The curriculum is based on facts and evidence about disparities, which helped me understand how systemic racism in our educational system is entrenched and pervasive. I also want to state that as a parent of white children, um, specifically, I want all my children's teachers to receive this kind of training to help my children and all children in our district to see the value of their background, culture, language, and family story and feel empowered to use their voice. The sense of belonging and being able to show up to school authentically will ultimately lead to their academic achievement. I support this initial DEI training and I hope a much more comprehensive training will happen district wide. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kim Pascades. Good evening, board president and board members. Recently, the school board adopted a board resolution affirming the district's commitment to justice through equity-driven policies, procedures, and practices. I support this agenda item, which puts into practice the commitment to justice through equity as stated in the board resolution. I believe the training outlined in this agenda item is the first step in the comprehensive district-wide anti-racism training that needs to happen at every level of the district. Students need to feel valued and affirmed and educators and staff should always be seeking to engage in professional development to improve their ability to serve all students in our district. All students can achieve at high levels and equitable classrooms are critical to their success. Eliminating disparities in educational opportunities is fundamental to the nature of public education. Some of the benefits of inclusion and diversity in the classroom for all students are students increase cultural understanding, stronger critical thinking skills, and enhance creativity, which all better prepare them for adulthood. When students enter the professional world, they will join a vast and diverse workforce. An educator who properly creates a culturally responsive environment will have fostered a classroom where students become respectful and understanding of cultures different from their own. Every student benefits from this framework. 
On the anniversary of the murder of George Floyd, we remind the board of the demands brought forward by the Black Student Union last year. The board resolution that was passed in response to one of those demands was to declare racism as a public health emergency. They also asked for the district to hire culturally competent teachers and staff and have culturally relevant curriculum. These trainings are a step in the right direction. They are, there are many more steps that need to follow these trainings, but I am in full support of funding equity, diversity, and inclusion, and inclusion professional development opportunities for, staff, for district educators and staff. Thank you. Thank you. Our last speaker is Cressida Silvers. Good evening. Uh, I'm a parent in the district and I'm speaking tonight in support of this item for high quality professional development for teachers around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Particularly today on the anniversary of George Floyd's murder, it's critical to support efforts that uphold the commitments you made to the community last year. Approving this item is but one step towards turning those statements into action and impacts. I've participated in several DEI trainings, including some led by Ally to Accomplice and its principles. And I just wanna underscore that, that when these types of trainings are done well, as these are, they succeed in bringing us together, not dividing us. Quality trainings are based on rigorous academic research. They're coupled with a professional approach that welcomes everyone into this work of fighting racism, regardless of our color, of our culture, our politics, or economic status. Through a studied combination of facts and invitations to sincere thought and discussion around those facts, a welcoming space forms for learning, reflecting, skill building, and bridge building. It's not about politics. It's not about guilt or shame. It's about moving forward together. Educators trained in inclusive and asset-based teaching then have the practical tools to foster the social, the emotional, and the physical well being of their students, which in turn creates a learning environment more conducive to high achievement by all students. And that's been my experience as a white parent with these programs and the experience of other white families that I know. And the research backs it up. Students of all ethnicities, including white students, benefit emotionally and academically from high quality teacher training programs programs like this. And there is no credible research to suggest otherwise, regardless of uninformed opinions we may hear from the litigious few. I would love for my children and all children in the district to share in these benefits for, from teachers supported with quality professional training and resources to help our children make sense of the world, of their place in it, and how they might help to make it even better. I hope you'll approve this item. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes public comment on this item. Thank you, Ms. Trujillo. And so before I call for a motion, board members or Superintendent Maldonado, are there any items on the consent agenda that you require to have more information, comments, or discussion? Ms. Sims Moten. I just have a, a quick comment on the, I, the four, on item four. Um, is this something that can be extended to the board? Or it may be part of our board retreat, because I think we can certainly benefit from this type of training as well. For the ally to accomplice work, we can to certainly have uh, include a board session or um, a workshop of some sort. I will reach out to the consultants. Okay, Sounds yes. like a great idea. Okay. Thank you. Yes, and the only other comment I have is on uh, uh, items under facilities 11 and 12. It's like, thank goodness we had a whole, <laughs> I remember those board meetings about those uh, PA systems, so I'm glad that we're completed yes, that issue. Indeed. Yes. Any other questions or comments? Seeing and hearing none, I would like a motion to approve the consent agenda, please. So moved. Thank you. And a second? Thank you, Ms. Munoz. Then all in favor, please signify by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 This motion the, for the consent agenda approval passes unanimously. And with that, we will go to our 10-minute break. And Mr. Rouse, please start the clock. I believe that takes us on to the action agenda for tonight. I think we have eight or nine items for our consideration. And the first one is an item on student discipline, which was discussed in closed session. So for this item, 
I'd like to have a motion to approve the Student Discipline Education Code 48918, case number 202021-01. So moved. Thank you, Ms. Sims Moten. And is there a second? Ms. Alvarez, thank you. All in favor, please signify by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 The motion passes unanimously. We're on to action item number two. I'm turning this over to Ms. Carey and Roundy Harder also for comments and review. All right, good evening, take two. Um, I'm bringing to you tonight uh, several requests for your approval uh, of contracts that will put us in a, in a solid and strong position uh, to build on our efforts in terms of curriculum, instruction, and assessment as we head into the 21-22 school year. Um, two of these contracts focus on assessment. Um, and first, with uh, Callahan Consulting, it is focused on math assessment. And I'm really representing the full ed services team and our TK-12 grade span and letting you know that our vision for math assessment in Santa Barbara Unified is an assessment program that is coherent and that it's aligned to our, our vision and our implementation plans. It is valid and focused and that it is standards aligned and it's actionable and that we use data from student work in order to drive improvements in our instructional practice. So aligned with that vision, we will be forming a task force. We'll have an elementary uh, math assessment team and a secondary math assessment team and they will participate in essentially what is action research. And we learned about that construct with Joe Feldman about equitable grading in the board study session. So using data from our own students' assessments, even, even this spring, uh, we will conduct cycles of inquiry uh, throughout next school year. And we'll do this in conjunction with Patrick Callahan, who's a, a recognized um, scholar and expert in this field. And particularly, I wanna emphasize that um, the emphasis of his work and the emphasis of our math assessment program will be to construct mathematical knowledge through language and specifically writing. And that is something that will be a shared area of emphasis across the grade spans. Uh, so with that, I'll just turn it over to you for any questions about this contract. I just had one a question. If you could be more specific about the pilot that's described happening in May right now with only a few days left in school. So our teachers are positioned to within these final days of school. Um, and these are secondary teachers I'm uh, talking about now. Uh, and do, do remember that we do have end of course exams and other things that we use to measure students learning over the course of a term. Uh, we have students, uh, teachers rather, identified at every grade level who are ready for the results of tonight's board action to administer uh, assessments that then will constitute our district's baseline data and will be used during the week of June 7th at our Summer Certificated Institute with Patrick on that Thursday about assessment uh, in order to begin to practice with and calibrate around uh, student work and to set up that same cycle for uh, next school year for both elementary and secondary. Sounds great to be able to use it in in June. Um, any board comments? Hearing and seeing none, then I would like to call for a motion to approve the memorandum of understanding between Callahan Consulting and the Santa Barbara Unified School District for designing a TK through 12 math assessment program and professional development. I move that we approve this item. Thank you. Second. Ms. Alvarez, and a second by Sims, Ms. Sims Moten. So please, all in favor, say aye and signify by raising your hand. Aye. Aye. This motion passes unanimously. And we go on to number three, which is approval of the classified management position and job description. I'll turn that over to Dr. Becchio. Thank you very much. Good evening, Board President Ford and board members. Uh, I bring this item to you. Um, I sent, I did include um, some background information in my board report um, that, um, that you can consider in your decision here tonight. I also wanted to just make a few comments of some pertinent points that I think will be helpful for you. Um, as you know, this um, type of position was of interest to the board uh, prior to the pandemic. Um, 
action on that did not materialize and we're bringing this back before you tonight as um, one it, it is a classified management position but uh, we think that strategically that is um, going to set the district up for the best success in the area of um, environmental stewardship and, and looking at all the sustainability practices across the district and the operations within the district um, to have that daily focus on the operations and how we can um, most importantly, improve our practices in the area of environmental concerns and sustainability, but also um, look for cost savings as well across our operations. And then um, the final point I wanted to um, I wanted to mention to you, and I did write it in the report, is that um, this board did express interest in the fact that we are a large employer in our county, and that. Um, this board had an interest in being a lead agency with respect to environmental issues and um, sustainability practices. So I wanted to leave that with you and then and then turn this item over to you for any questions that you might have. Thank you. I don't have any questions. I have nothing but um, great delight that this is finally happening. Uh, mm -hmm. Board members, are there any questions or comments? Ms. Caps. I'm not surprised. I know. I'll keep it brief. <laughs> Don't worry. We uh, thanks to uh, the previous board, uh, with uh, prior to Ms. Alvarez joining us, um, for passing this already twice before. And I just want to thank the Sustainability Committee and just remind uh, the public and 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 my colleagues on the board that this what idea came from our Sustainability Committee, which is made up of teachers, students, community members, and parents, and. Um, this is not a new concept. Most districts, many districts have a sustainability director. I talked to a few and I did research on others. Uh, specifically, Oxnard Union has a sustainability director for the last 10 years, Miss Marianne LaRue. If anyone wants to talk with her, she's quite enthusiastic. She went to UCSB. Uh, she says she feels such gratification that not only is she helping our students uh, by showing this example, um, and helping the environment, but she's saving money to the tune of uh, $435,000 a year um, times 10. So that's quite a bit of money um, in that one position. And she added that it feels good to not to be a, the one position that's not drawing from the budget, but actually adding to it tremendously. So cost uh, really makes this a win from any perspective you look at it. And I just am excited and grateful to Dr. Maldonado and Dr. Becchio for bringing this forward again so that we can actually make it into a reality and thanking the sustainability committee, many of whom are might be listening and watching today for the due diligence and we're getting our meetings back on track. And again, uh, it's about time and I'm glad we're moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Alvarez. Yes, a uh, couple of questions. Um, I think this is great. The sustainability, of course, is of uh, importance and interest to, I believe, to all of us. So thank you for bringing this forward. I'm also very much interested in seeing how are we going to measure the savings. Um, we're dedicating $130,000 from our budget, but we are expecting a higher return, not only for the environment, of course, which is paramount, in addition to the to the fiscal side. So I'm really interested in seeing how that's going to develop and how that's going to be achieved. So I'm I'm looking forward to seeing an update on that maybe <laughs> next spring, next year, when this has been in place for at least a year. So that's one comment. And then the other question is, will this person be going to the school sites and working with the students, working with the staff and teaching them the importance of the, saving the environment and recycling? Because I've heard some school sites saying, we don't have a recycling program, we haven't done that. So this person will be, I'm assuming this person will be helping the school sites as well. Yeah, that's a great question. The, the majority of the work that gets accomplished in the district is at a school site. And this um, person will most certainly have a lot of work to do at the school sites. There are many places within the school sites where uh, students may um, have an interest in this space, but may need some some help coordinating and having an adult there that can that can help lead them. So I believe a lot of the work will be happening at the school sites. Thank you. 
Ms. sims Mountain, please. Yes, um, so I was one of those board members that had concerns about it <laughs> when we first voted it and not against in terms of, you know, being have environmentally sustainable, but having it come back, look at this, I'm in full support of it with regards to where we're looking at. I appreciate the questions that Ms. Alvarez, you know, raised with regards to how we're gonna measure the savings, um, but I'm in full support of that because I, I really look at, it, it's, it's much more explainable this way in terms of what it's gonna actually do how are our students are gonna be involved in that. So I just wanted to um, acknowledge that. Thank you. And Ms. Munoz, please. Yes, I also want to voice my support of this. Um, we had, you know, and I appreciate Ms. Capps bringing it forward, which seems like a long time ago, and it, it was indeed. Um, we have, you know, the responsibility for the future. And I know that we had an evening here with different with students from different high schools and one of the classes at San Marcos was focused on sustainability and had many great ideas that they presented. So I see that tying into, you know, with this, this position. Um, so certainly this has my full support and it's, it's long overdue, but it's perfect. Thank you. And I echo the support of my uh, colleagues on the board. So please, now that we've seen, uh, we've heard from Dr. Becchio, we've had some discussion, some questions. May I have a mo motion to approve item number three, classified management position and job description for operations and sustainability coordinator. So moved. Thank you, Ms. Caps, And a second. Thank you, Ms. Sims Moten. All in favor, please signify by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 This motion passes unanimously too. On to number four. Um, Ms. Chate will be telling us a little bit about the, uh, the request for us to accept the public disclosure of 2020-21 collective bargaining agreement for Santa Barbara Teachers Association and the California School Employees Association per AB 1200. Thank you, President Ford. Good evening, board members and Superintendent Maldonado. AB um, 1200 um, is our collective bargaining agreement in accordance with for the Santa Barbara Teachers Association, confidential and management. There is no CSEA in this agreement. Um, they have not reached approval or we have not reached an agreement with negotiations. So you will be seeing another one come at once we have finalized negotiations. We are required to present this agreement to you prior to the board approving any compensation for its employees. The California, oh, I just mentioned that, that they, the CSEA is not in this agreement. This is a three year agreement from July 1, 2021 through June 30th, 2024. The cost of living adjust, adjustment or COLA is 3.5%, 2.5%, and 2% respectively. In addition to the COLA, the district agreed to pay 70% of the 6% increase to health insurance. We've also agreed to give bilingual stipends for those who qualify um, for teachers and increase the stipend for those teachers who teach co uh, combo classes. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions regarding the AB 1200 collective bargaining agreement. Disclosure. Thank you. I don't believe we have public comments. So board members, do you have any questions or comments that haven't been addressed before? Just want to say thank you to Ms. Jate and Dr. Maldonado for answering all my questions. I had uh, several questions that have been answered. So thank you very much. Sounds great. Then I would like to have a motion now to approve item number four, the public disclosure of the collecting collective bargaining agreements for the Santa Barbara Teachers Association per AB 1200. Thank you, Ms. Munoz. And a second, please. Ms. Caps, thank you. So all in favor, please signify by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 This motion passes unanimously. On to number five. This is actual approval of the tentative agreement between Santa Barbara's Unified School District and the Santa Barbara Teachers Association. Dr. Becchio. Thank you, and as you can imagine, I'm very excited to bring this item forward <laughs> to you. Uh, just a quick comment about the item. Um, this board and, and our superintendent's vision to secure a three-year, not only a three-year contract, because that's what we really were doing this year in, the, in getting a successor agreement, but also 
to to really step outside the norm and and try to reach a three year, three year compensation deal and um, the health and welfare um, compensation deal is very good for employees. And so I want to commend the board and our superintendent for having that vision. Um, you'll see that in this document that it contains that the, the um, Santa Barbara Teachers Association did, did rat, Association did ratify this. And so with that, we can bring that forward to the board for your approval and put this into action. With that, I'll answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Dr. Vecchio. I know I, I uh, am so happy with the work that you've done and your team did, and also the questions, the discussion, and, and the oversight of the board in this item. So I'm, I'm very excited that we may be approving it. So board members, any questions or comments? See, yes, please. Yes. Again, thank you to the team for all your work. Uh, I know this takes a lot of work, a lot of time, and um, a lot of effort. So thank you. I have no further comments except that I'm glad we have a three-year agreement so we know where we stand, we can budget, and um, I think it's also good for the employees as well. So thank you for your work. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve item number five, the tentative agreement between the district and Santa Barbara Teachers Association? So moved. Thank you, Ms. sims Moten. Ms. Alvarez, would you like a second? Yes, I'll second that. Great. All in favor, please signify by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 All in favor. Sorry. Motion passes unanimously. <laughs> On to number six. For item uh, number six, I will turn this also over to Dr. Becchio for comments and review. Thank you very much. And as you are aware, we have two classifications of employees that are not represented by a bargaining unit. Uh, that is the cert, um, confidential employees and our management employees, both classified and certificated. And so this agreement represents um, a a Me Too um, compensation deal where the compensation deal will be the same as what we've reached with SBTA. So it's before you for your approval for those two classifications. Excellent. Thank you. Any board comments or questions on this? Me Too. If not, I wonder if I may have a motion to approve item number six, the tentative agreement between the non represented um, management and confidential employees and Santa Barbara Unified School District. Thank you, Ms. Munoz. And a second? Ms. Sims Moten, great. All in favor, please signify by raising your hand and saying aye. Aye. The motion passes unanimously. May and I, now? Ms. Ford, may I make a comment, please? I, I want to say thank you to all of us, the SB Unified employees, for all your work for making the district the great place that it is and for supporting the students, all of management, Ms. Dr. Maldonado, all of our teachers, our classified employees. Thank you very much for all that you do. Absolutely, thank you. On to number seven, for action item number seven, I'm turning this over to Ms. Jette for comments and review on the expanded learning opportunity plan. Thank you. Good evening once again, board members. The district will receive $37.5 million in federal and state relief, and $9.7 million of that is de dedicated to expanded learning opportunity grant. This grant is for the district to provide in-person instruction for learning loss for those students who most need it. The district has requir is required to have board approval, board approved expenditure plan by June 1st of 2021, this plan also includes additional staffing that Dr. Becchio brought to you and the board for approved and was approved on May 11th. So um, we have staff here to answer any questions you have about the expended, uh, uh, the ELO or the expended learning opportunity grant expenditure plan. <laughs> <laughs> Say what? <laughs> that thing. <laughs> I think we know we've had an opportunity to review it and also ask you questions up till now. I wonder if there are any additional questions or comments. Seeing none, I will ask for a motion to approve this item, please. Uh, the Santa Barbara Unified School District's Expanded Learning Opportunity Plan. A motion. Thank you, Ms. Munoz. A second. Ms. Alvarez, so all in favor, please signify by raising your hand and saying aye. Aye. This motion passes unanimously. 
I'll be turning over the next item, number eight, for the approval of the three-year extension to explore learning, explore learning proposal for virtual labs to Ms. Carey and Ms. Roundy Howder. Uh, thank you, and good evening once again. Uh, just me, and I'll be brief as I was last time. Uh, this one the, is a, a contract for something we call in the field gizmos, and I'll make three points about it. One is that uh, this is a contract that really represents a bridge from the experiences and lessons of this pandemic year into the future. So we learned very quickly as we had remote instruction realities that it was difficult to replicate hands-on science learning. But even as we return to in-person learning, there are certain simulations that do a better job teaching students about how things work in the real world than you can easily replicate in the classroom. The second point is that uh, Dr. Maldonado and myself had the benefit of being able to observe this in action at a classroom at Santa Barbara High School. And the lesson was on the um, acidification of soil runoff and the impacts of that in, in lake waters and, and bodies of water and the wildlife that live within those bodies of water. So you can uh, do lab experiments related to those phenomenon, but you can't manipulate the variables associated with the ecosystem within the four walls of the classroom the way you can in this virtual lab. So that was just something that we got to observe and experience and appreciate. I wanted to highlight that this is a contract for three years. So the dollar amount is, uh, is, is about the three year uh, extension of gizmos and that it is available for upper grades teachers in elementary as well as they deepen their learning with the FOSS ELD curriculum uh, in an elementary grade span. And I'm available for your questions. Oh, thank you so much. This is an amazing uh, program, and I love the fact that 90% of science teachers ranked it as four or five on a scale of five. Um, sometimes teachers don't all agree about anything, so uh, I think it's um, amazing. So, board members, any comments, questions? Please, Ms. Munoz. No, just that I share the excitement, um, and I would love to see it in action when it's implemented. Great. Seeing no further comments or questions, I would uh, love to call for a, uh, a motion to approve the three-year extension to explore learning proposal for virtual labs. So moved. Thank you, Ms. Alvarez. May the board participate in this too, Ms. Carey? <laughs> I think our science teachers would welcome you to do so, yes. Thank you. So moved. And is there a second? Thank you, Ms. Munoz. All in favor, please signify by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 Ms. Alvarez? <laughs> this motion passes unanimously. Number nine is the approval of the 2021-22 contract with, I think it's Bozeman Science Incorporated for the design and implementation of NGSS aligned performance tasks and cycles of inquiry. Ms. Carey. We're continuing with the theme of science. Um, I want to give you some shorthand for that agenda item title and say assessment in science TK-12. So where we are in the adoption of our NGSS standards and the curriculum that is aligned to those is really building on the assessment component of science education in the Common Core era. So when you see performance tasks and cycles of inquiry, what this will do, and Paul Anderson is the expert who's associated with Bozeman Science, is to assist, lend expertise to, to teacher teams as they develop common assessments across the district, two per grade level. And of course, that's a different science course at every grade level in secondary. And then similarly to what I explained before with the math, uh, math subject, having team, teams of teachers participate in, and be guided through those cycles of inquiry to calibrate on their analysis of student work and have that inform improvements in instructional practice. So this is definitely, um, as with math, this is definitely about a gradual release of responsibility to the teachers themselves as the classroom practitioners and as, as teacher leaders and using uh, best practice assessments as drivers for improved instruction. And again, this is one that uh, is brought to you with consideration for how this is mirrored um, across all grade levels with FOSS ELD in, in K-5 and what uh, will hopefully soon be K-6, um, and the, the sci already adopted science curriculum in 712. Uh, so with that, I uh, would invite any questions you may have. 
Oh, thank you. I'll just say that I am so uh, pleased to see that, of course, after all of the hard work that's gone into everything related to COVID-19, that now the focus is clearly on math and science and literacy, and that's really exciting. Board members, are there any questions? Please, Ms. sims -Moten. I just echo what you just said, um, President Ford, and I also want to tell uh, uh, Ms. Carey, that I actually know what NGSS is, Next Generation Science Standards. I'm just telling you, because I there's so much like there were so many acronyms of what we don't know, and, and you know how we continue <laughs> to build upon you know this important of building blocks of, of information. So I just wanted to share that I, I finally got there. Thank you. Any other comments? If not, I would love to have a motion to approve item number nine, 2021 22 contract with Bozeman Science for the design and implementation of J NGSS aligned performance tasks and cycles of inquiry. Ms. Caps, thank you. And a second? Ms. Alvarez, great. All in favor, please signify by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 The motion passes unanimously. And that's it for voting tonight. Sure. I just want to say thank you to the board members, but also I want to thank our um, executives in charge of Ed services, the directors and the specialists and experts who were really uh, asked to keep uh, iterating on these plans and ensuring that we did have a unified approach, TK-12, to many of the things that we brought before you today. You can and tell. I appreciate their patience with me as I, I continue to ask them to ensure that we're keeping that uni unified uh, school district approach and ensure that all children are getting access to all these great tools. Thank you. I appreciate that and I second that. Uh, we go on to number three, the third report, since we've already done two reports tonight, and that is Operationalizing Equity, LCAP 2021-2024, the Plan Development Update, and I turned it over to Mr. Vence. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Board President, board, board members, and Dr. Maldonado. Uh, this evening I bring to you Aha. Uh -huh. Right. Today or this evening, I bring to you the uh, update regarding the development of, yes, another acronym, the LCAP, the Local Control Accountability Plan. Uh, I will briefly present four items to you. The first one is the key recommendations made by all stakeholders uh, are three LCAP goals with key actions an overview of expenditures, and of course, next steps to continue and review and finally approve our LCAP. Next slide, please. Since the last report on April 25th, we have completed the process of gathering and analyzing data from last school year and this school year. We've met with stakeholders sharing this information and receiving the recommendations and lastly, reviewed with the Parent Advisory Committee the first draft of our LCAP goals, actions, and expenditures. Next slide. And again, our stakeholders include students, Santa Barbara Unified teachers, staff, uh, administrators, parents, guardians, and community members. Next slide, please. We held four meetings with our Parent Advisory Committee to educate them about the LCAP process and our district's basic aid funding. We also uh, we met with them to receive information about our district's successes and challenges during this past school year and this year, as well as to review the drafted goals, actions, and expenditures and receive feedback and guidance from them. Next slide. The one thing that was really clear that came from all stakeholders is that they really wanted to make sure that we focus our resources on those students who need it the most. That came from all the stakeholders in terms of students all the way out to the community. That meant focusing on our emergent multilingual learners, our low-income students, and our foster youth. Those are 
as you know, the designated uh, unduplicated students. Next slide, please. I forgot to mention one other thing. Uh, one of the key things that they asked for specifically was, as this will be no surprise to you, which is number one was uh, mental health services. Uh, the other one was student college and career readiness. Another key thing was actually, again, academic support, which is really the learning recovery that, that we're facing right now. Um, and the last one was uh, our community and family partnerships, expanding that. We had three goals in particular. And the first goal, as you could see, uh, I'll read it since it's sort of blocked off. Uh, use relevant and inclusive instruction, curriculum, and assessments to ensure our students experience learning that is meaningful, engaging, responsive, and individualized to increase college and career preparedness. Goal one has several actions that fit into these two buckets or these two key areas, which is increased student in English language arts and mathematics achievement. Some of the actions included secondary uh, math support sections, uh, college and career ready readiness uh, coordinator. Uh, we had also specialists focusing on tier one support and differentiated instruction. Uh, and also in this section, we have the professional learning community. That's where we actually have, it's like what I call the two for one, which is we have our arts teachers and the PE teachers working with the students. And then we are able to pull out grade level um, uh, time for the teachers to actually do professional learning, looking at data and so on. And we can actually leverage that as we go into next year for MTSS, which is really important. So that's in place. And also the kids are, as I know that you're an arts community, so they're getting that, that instruction. The second one, expanding targeted language and literacy interventions. Some of the key areas or some of the key things that we'll be focusing on is that came out, we're going to be providing ELA and math tutoring directly to students. We have interventionists providing tier three support to the kids. We have also language and literacy coaches providing tier two support. So as you can see, we're having all of these things are coming together to work along with what, where we're moving ahead in terms of the multi-tiered systems of support. So this is really a, a coordinated effort on all levels. Uh, next slide, please. The second goal, create and sustain safe and affirming learning environments, ensuring our students and families feel valued, respected, and connected to our schools. And so these have three actions that we're really focusing on. First one, again, that's providing comprehensive mental health services for our students and really investing in that. The second one is, as you can see, the student learning and wellness. Um, and that's just providing liaisons to provide parent education and so, so parents could actually support their children with the with the, what they need in terms of learning, as well as physical and mental wellness, right? The last one is a collaborative support for students and families through translation and interpretation. That one was very important. That also came out in terms of where we got these strong recommendations from our ELAC uh, councils, as well as DLAC, um, as well as our Spanish-speaking families, which is DLAC and ELAC representatives. And we also got that from our Santa Barbara Unified staff. Next slide, please. The third goal that we have is drive equitable student outcomes through culturally and linguistically sustaining organizational transformation, ensuring policies and practices increase high levels of success for every student, regardless of their economic circumstance, culture, race, ethnicity, or language. Um, and as you could hear from people who have been mentioning this tonight, how this is also a very important goal within our LCAP as coming from some of our speakers. Two things that, uh, with, that we're focusing on particular is really our strong AVID and PEAK programs. AVID is, 
in happening during the school day, but the peak is the true wraparound. Again, very similar to the MTS model, which is it's not just focusing on academics. Um, this one right here, we're still deciding whether to keep it in goal three or put it into goal one. So that's just one of the conversations that, that is still occurring with this. Um, the second one is to create um, and cultivate culturally sustaining school communities by providing professional learning to teachers, as well as following through with the ethnic studies courses. Uh, as you know, that, that, that's been one of the things that we've been working on in the school district. Next slide. As you can see by the chart, the, the majority of our LCAP funding is going towards goal one uh, it's with the academics and college career readiness. Uh, goal three in particular, receiving the second highest allotment, which uh, the majority of the funding there is actually going towards um, AVID and PEAK programs, which is approximately 2.2 million. Uh, goal two and is uh, the majority of that is actually going towards mental and social and emotional services to students, which is approximately 1.6 million. A um, little over, just so you know that little mo, excuse me, little over nine million dollars of our district LCAP funding, which is about 78 percent, will be going towards direct services to students. Okay, so just so that you know that this is direct services to students who will be receiving this, this service, these services. Next slide. And we're coming to the end, June. Wow, next week. So um, by the end of this week, uh, my goal is to submit a rough draft of the LCAP for just initial, 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 thank you very much, initial <laughs> review. Uh, uh, by the county office so they can actually take a look at it, look at the fiscal component to make sure that we're on track so we, we can solve any problems before we even go further. The second step is to update the draft of our LCAP and then uh, send that to the PAC as well as sending to you so everyone has an opportunity to review and prepare for the June 8th LCAP public hearing. And then, of course, we'll continue to be editing that as we lead forward to June 22nd, which is the review and then re approval process at that board meeting. And with that said, we'll open it up for any questions. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Hill, I don't believe we have any, oh, we do, we have comments on this one, I believe, at least one. Yes, we do, we have two uh, comments on this item. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's. Um, Roseanne Crawford and Muni Duet. Roseanne Crawford. Hi, Roseanne Crawford here. I see little optimizing of equity in this budget proposal. I see smoke and mirrors. It's one more spreadsheet that contains a few cells of creative writing. It does not say exactly who is contracted or which schools will receive what services. There are no breakdowns, no transparency, just vague lump sums. I can understand why some people are beginning to talk about a FICMAT audit. The biggest LCAP funds are for bilingual education and META, same program, which is a major question. Why not out of the general budget for those items as the classes are to be balanced with 50% English speakers along with 50% English learners over not just a whole class, a whole school is proposed for the fall. There are many expenditures with no clear definition, only descriptions of goals. Lucy Goosey would never be tolerated in private business. This district's job is to educate not to be socially engineering young minds that still need to be developing reading, writing, and math skills all the way through the end of high school to prepare for success. Governor Newsom, as you recall, put a pause on the ethnic studies requirement because it was determined not inclusive. What materials are proposed? No detail. No wonder the state of California Department of Education in 2019 and 20 found LA Unified School District in violation, unable to find $2 billion of LCAP funds. We won't accept the same standard here. Thank you. Thank you. Our last speaker is Moni Duet. 
Thanks again, Sandra and, and board. I appreciate you um, staying and hearing because my experience sadly on the LCAP parent advisory board was that I really didn't get to meaningfully engage. And as it was reported back to you, I have to honestly say, we were allowed to speak for a minute, but we weren't really allowed to even make up our own goals. The goals were presented in a very general way. And my concern um, is that I, I would like to see it be more transparent so I can tell if we are really addressing the painfully low literacy and math scores at some of our um, campuses with the most socioeconomic students, um, you know, experiencing hardship. And so without that breakdown, the, it looks to me like so much of the money is going district wide. And I need to be sure these kids' needs are being met and met appropriately because we should be automatically assessing them and we should be considering how they can get intensive interventions over the summer so they can close that gap. And none of this was discussed at all or invited to be discussed. And frankly, I would love it if someone um, would discuss this with me. I, I really, really long to have answers to this issue. I've researched it. It's close to my heart. I think it's really impactful on a large amount of our students and they shouldn't continue to suffer in the way that they do. And I would really like to have a real discussion and not come to a meeting where I have to watch somebody else's slides and feel a, a lot of pressure not to say too, too much and really can't develop thoughts that, um, you know, really do impact our students. And there were other parents too, want to talk about suspension and things that impact our kids and push kids out of school and really want to have this conversation. And I, with Mr. Vence, with Sean Carey, Fran Wagonek, anybody, but I, I feel I'm, like it's important. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes public comment. Thank you, Ms. Trujillo. <laughs> um, Mr. Vince, I, uh, I, I know that you're new here, but you certainly are probably aware now that there have been some concerns about the amount or the validity or the depth of um, parent community feedback and input. And I'd just like to share that uh, that happens everywhere. And so one thing that I was able to do where I came from before was I actually, in the final draft of the plan, I highlighted the, uh, the uh, strategies and implementations that were a direct result of the community feedback. And then I'd like to suggest that you consider something like that so that we could really point to the fact that this came from the community and this is in the plan. It's a great idea. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, cool. And I have no other uh, comments other than goal number three, as valid as it and important as it sounds, it's very hard for a community member to unpack what that really means. And if there's any way that you can turn it into more, I don't know, accessible language, that would be great. I, I totally understand. And we've been having this conversation. And actually, that's the last goal that needed to be edited to the point where it's attainable by Somebody everybody. Knows. So everybody can hear it and understand it. Thank right you. Away. Yeah. So, great. Thank you so yeah. much. Members of the board, are there any comments or questions? Thank you, Ms. Sims Moten. Yes, thank you. And I, I can I concur with your comments as though that can we make it plain, you know, so that we can be clear. But on goal three, can you just talk about when we say implement AVID and peak programs, aren't they already implemented or what are we doing here? Are you integrating or um as so I'm not 100% sure, but I do believe that this is the conversation about expansion of peak programs. Yes. Okay. Yes, that's correct. Uh, Mr. Venz has it right. So it is about continuing to articulate the efforts of the AVID program, which is the uh, support during the day with the wraparound kinds of services, as Mr. Venz described them, that PEAK provides. Um, so that those are really articulating well, so continue to strengthen that relationship, but principally to expand our peak learning centers and um, to expand the number of uh, contracted tutors and mentors that we have working with our AVID and peak students um, so that we can, we, can serve, we can serve more of them and deepen the services they receive. 
I'd like to add to that, that we know that the PEAK program was started through the generous donations of philanthropy in this community. It has been in place so, um, close to 10 years now with proven results. And so it is important for this district to recognize, thank our funders for that support, but looking at proven results with practices that we can now make part of the regular program, which means including taking on the expenses that have been uh, historically generated through uh, funding support outside the district. And that's another part of why I think it's so important that we recognize these and not just have it for certain groups of students, but really in expanding the pool of students that will participate in these programs. Thank you. Yeah, that's exactly where I was going. I mean, having, you know, come here and looked at the peak now for or years ago and certainly understand the, the support from the community funder who has done this over the years. And it, does, it is a successful program, but it was it was limited. And so to see it now as part of our equity driven work is, is I'm, I'm delighted to see that. So that's what I was hoping that's what it was, but I wasn't sure. OK, thank you, Ms. Munoz. Yes, I also just had a question about ethnic studies, if that would fall under goal three for the um for the this pro the LCAP? um I, I believe it would because that's where it's focusing on specifically that goal um and that's where it's been yeah thank okay. you Sean so that's where it's been as we as we've been starting this process of developing the goals and action steps so, right excellent yeah. okay thank yeah. you Ms. Alvarez yes um Goal one, uh, what it talks about the increase, the goal to increase student English language arts and mathematics achievement. Um, I mean, I know that we are all, everybody's concerned about literacy and math, the opportunity gap that there is. So is this goal directly related to that? Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? So one more time. The so in our district, we're all concerned about the opportunity gap for certain students certain right. populations in literacy and mathematics specifically yes goal one says that our goal is to increase student english language arts and mathematics achievement my question is is that directly related to this issue of that opportunity gap that exists in our population yes definitely yeah that that's definitely part of this has been from looking at the data that we've seen and the subgroups where it was really clear of what's happening. And so it's one of those targeted goals to, to actually address specifically that. And if you notice that we, we're already leaning into the, the tier system with tier one providing uh, various um, differentiated instruction in the classroom, tier two more focused and tier three you know, highly focused. But yes, the, the tier two and three is really focusing on that as we move forward so and this targeted tutoring that you mentioned it will be at different sites for example mckinley cleveland franklin it will be targeting every student that needs that support is that correct that's that's the goal yeah or that's one of the actions that's of, one of the, the actions yeah, yeah. for the lcap correct great thank yeah. you yeah. great any other comments or questions um, you didn't ask for our opinions specifically, but I, I think that Peak and Avid could definitely go under goal number one, and I think that it makes them stronger to do that. Seeing none, thank you so much for your report, and we'll move on to item number four, and that's the report on the early learning plan with First Five Santa Barbara County. Yay. Um, I know there's folks that are coming on. <laughs> I've been... Uh, actually, to see this come to fruition is really good and exciting. And as we were going over this LCAP, all of those goals really can be merged with early learning. And so we're not, you know, we certainly can reduce the intervention if we're really starting at that early learning um, foundation. And, and I, I equate it to, you know, when they're getting that good foundation, they get good, they get better, and then they get the best opportunities. Because not only, you know, we're looking at, at, at the early opportunity, we can look at math, we can look at all of those things. And so how we tie these early learning plannings to our LCAPs is critical to how we are able to then really be successful in increasing, you know, the length, increasing the proficiency. So I'm excited that this um, report is coming forth and I'm looking forward to hearing it. 
With that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Escobedo and Ms. Uh, Lafridge. Okay, there we are. Good evening, board members, President Ford and community. So excited to talk to you tonight. Uh, and I know it's late at night, so I'm gonna just turn it right over. I'm very excited to be able to turn this over, this presentation that I know you will all be just as thrilled to hear about. Uh, and so uh, I know our friends are waiting and have been patiently uh, waiting to be able to present. So I'm handing it off to Principal Binkley from Harding, uh, Daisy Ochoa, our Early Childhood Educator Coordinator, and a familiar friend to Santa Barbara Unified, Michelle Robertson, who is the Assistant Director of First Five Santa Barbara County. And uh, ladies, take it away. If we can go ahead okay. and get Sorry started. Sorry about that. So we, we've been waiting hours to get in and then technical difficulties right, right at the end. So um, good evening, um, everybody, uh, board members, Superintendent Maldonado, staff and the public. My name is Michelle Robertson and I am the Assistant Director of First Five Santa Barbara County, uh, which is also known as the Children and Families Commission. I'm here tonight with Veronica Binkley and Daisy Ochoa to share with you the partnership between uh, First Five and Santa Barbara Unified around early learning and our intent to prepare for the California Master uh, Plan for Early Learning rollout that will be um, happening this next fiscal year. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with First Five, we are funded by dollars collected through Proposition 10 which is a tax on tobacco products and was established in 1999. Our strategic intent is as stewards of these dollars is that by 2030, 70% uh, of children um, entering kindergarten in Santa Barbara County will be ready to thrive. We measure this outcome through strategic uh, evaluation with UC Santa Barbara and our work lies in the window of opportunity of birth through kindergarten. Next slide. Our local commission has worked over the last 18 months to design and approve a new strategic plan that dramatically changes our funding strategies. Um, as first five uh, revenues continue to decline, we have evolved into working with systems that serve children and families as what we are calling anchor organizations. This includes the three systems of the family home, the medical home, and the schools. So we are working with Santa Barbara Unified because we are interested in what you do as a system rather than funding any particular program. Next slide. Thank you, Brian. Sorry, I'm a little... My notes are stuck, sorry. Um, so why are we here? Uh, we have been measuring kindergarten readiness as an outcome for 20 years. And while we have made small strides in raising scores, we have yet to meet the population shift that we have sought. Currently, less than 40% of our children are entering school ready to access kindergarten curriculum across our county. We consider this a social justice issue that needs to be addressed. Next slide. We also have 20 years of evidence that correlates these scores to third grade proficiency. Um, you talk a lot about language, um, English language arts and math and uh, addressing this in early childhood is the most economical approach. Through our longitudinal work with UCSB in several districts, including this one, we have reliable and valid data that children who meet school readiness indicators continue to do well in their early academic years. Those who enter behind tend to stay behind, and therefore the only way to address the achievement gap is to concentrate on the readiness gap. Next slide. This is not a new problem. We have 50 years of research around brain development that tells us that the opportunities that a child is given from birth to age five lays the foundation for pre-reading and pre-math skills. Uh, there is essential for school success. The biggest gains in early intervention are seen with our struggling subgroups such as socioeconomically disadvantaged, special needs, and multilingual learners. 
I wonder if we we could stop for a moment, Michelle. I'm sorry, but it's very very hard for us to hear. We're yeah, not sure I, where I, the, uh, we're yeah. not sure where the dog is coming from, but uh, the dog is overriding your comments. Yes, I sincerely apologize for that. Oh no problem. Do you yeah. mind uh, <laughs> do you mind starting that slide again, please? Yes, this is not a new problem. We have 50 years of research around brain development that tells us that the opportunities that a child is given from birth through age five lays the foundation for pre-reading and pre-math skills that are essential for success in school. The biggest gains in early intervention are seen with our struggling subgroups, such as socioeconomically disadvantaged, special needs, and multilingual learners. It is more economical to invest in early childhood than to pay for intervention or special education services later. Next slide. I know that my colleague, um, Daisy Cho is going to speak with you about the master plan in more detail and what it means for the district. Um, next slide. But I would like to say that this is a really exciting time in California. Um, as the governor and the president and the White House are proposing to invest billions of dollars in the youngest children. Next slide. This includes expansion of transitional kindergarten to all our four-year-olds and setting the stage for best practices in the classroom that allow for our children to get the experience they need. Next slide. So over the last year, FIRST 5 has worked with Santa Barbara Unified to develop an early learning plan in anticipation for the master plan rollout and to begin to plan for and implement those early childhood foundations that will help us reach our strategic intent. This includes recognizing, naming, and addressing those opportunity gaps and um, implementing these best practice strategies that we have listed here. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Veronica. Good evening, Superintendent or Dr. Maldonado and board. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to present this very, very exciting opportunity um, for our district. So next slide, please, Brian. In order for us to help our children achieve their highest potential, we need to unleash the full power of our community and full power of all of our school, not just what's in the classroom. What would this look like? Next slide, please. Through this opportunity, we envision an outdoor space that's more park than schoolyard. Next slide. An environment that gives students both the room to run and to let off steam and, next slide, the opportunity to explore, explore steam in the outdoors. We see an outdoor space populated with native plants. There are surprises, puzzles, and opportunities for students to create collaborative adventures that help them to, to discover. They find new learning that they want to share and they, they improve, their language, improve their language skills. There are thematic stations enticing them to engage with science, technology, engineering, and math. Next slide. And the next slide, I'm gonna pass it on to Daisy for the next couple slides. Good evening, everyone. Um, so, or, okay, I can barely see the slide, but that's just my view. But um, so if you see the slide here, Harding is one of the five title schools that covers approximately three and a half acres. So over 70% is outdoor space. And if you've walked Harding, you can see the beautiful um, campus that they have. Uh, during an average six hour day uh, for school age students, um, kids spend about 80% of their time outdoors. The hour they spent, or I'm sorry, in, 80% of the time indoors inside the classroom. The hour they do spend outside for recess or lunch is usually targeted to get their energy out. You know, in preschool, we do spend some more time outside and some learning does take place outside, but by providing spaces of exploration and discovery, um, outdoor shifts in, into um, learning time. Next slide, Brian. So this slide speaks um, for itself. So if we just imagine over an entire school year, that one hour a day that kids are spending outside really comes out to be about five weeks of school time. So that's um, 
really valuable time that you know kids can be really exploring in, in, in their outdoor space. Um, next slide, Brian. Another problem um, that this plan really solves in our community is just the need for green space. Um, so if you click keep on clicking there, Brian, I think there's a couple more text. There we go. So if you guys see this map here and where um, Harding is located, um, you'll see that the, the Harding School sits in the middle of one of only two zones um, identified as a high need for green space um, and for the surrounding area and the residents in the, within that community. Um, over half of the students, I would add, in Santa Barbara Unified School District come from socioeconomic economic disadvantaged households. So just imagine the shift that this would do to our students and children in our community and how, en um, and how engaged learning can help those um, help close the achievement gap, just like the one that Michelle was referring to earlier. Um, I want to highlight that, you know, we are using Harding as a pilot. Veronica has, is a bit advocator and supporter for, early, for um, our early ed education program. Um, so it's a great place to start and obviously the need is there. But the plan is also to enhance the outdoor learning environment across the district, prioritizing sites that have the early education classrooms at their site. As we mentioned earlier, this aligns well with the California Master and ensuring that our facilities are ready for universal preschool that is coming really soon. Next slide. Back to me. Oh, okay. Our vision for this plan is to formulate a new model for learning, one that addresses issues of equity and access. What if we broke down the traditional vision of learn inside and play outside and instead created programs and spaces that inspire teachers and kids to use the entire campus as a space for innovative learning. What if we provided targeted sustained training for our teachers so they could fully leverage these spaces for their students growth and learning. And what if these improvements and, tra and training enhanced English language development, social and emotional well being, and access to enriched curriculars, science, technology, art, engineering, and math? Next slide. We have already begun the prototyping of curriculum, which has been intentional, intentional in design and embraced by students of all ages. The conversation has already changed. Click. Another click for number two. <laughs> we have begun to see empowered students using their voice, choice, and ownership in our STEAM lab. Click for three. We have begun to invest in getting teachers and students familiar with the principles of makerspace education and comfortable with conducting learning beyond the four classroom walls. And we have already begin, begun to build this out in both McKinley and the Santa Barbara Community Academy. Next slide or click. As we begin to develop the outdoor learning spaces at Harding, we will build out the entire network of both STEAM and outdoor 21st century learning spaces, ensuring that we can make it all come to life by cultivating a growing network of community partners. Next slide. We we are confident that this comprehensive program will nourish and grow in Santa Barbara Unified right alongside our young students. And I would like to just really quickly add on and comment that this about this project as it relates to MTSS, which Steve Venz so eloquently pointed to in the last presentation. We have already seen an impact in student engagement through the opportunities provided to date in our STEAM lab. We see authentic use of academic language. We see students designing and discovering and wanting to share the things that they're proud of and they're building their student agency and self-esteem. So in a nutshell, our STEAM program has augmented already language acquisition and is building social and emotional wellness in tier one. Next slide, back to Michelle. All right, let's see if I can get through this without the dogs going crazy again. Um, to, so just to wrap up, uh, First Five is excited to invest early in this plan. And we anticipate state, federal, and local dollars to help us uh, fully fund the strategy. As partners, 
uh, we are seeking a commitment from Santa Barbara Unified to embrace the premise that without strengthening the early foundations of learning, our students will continue to struggle through a system that has them compete based on circumstances they had no control over. As an equity value, uh, let us look at prevention and early intervention as a means of support by giving our youngest students opportunities to thrive. Next slide. So we're gonna leave you with this quote and uh, we are here as a team to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, wow. A lot of wonderful things planned ahead. I know board members have comments. I think they do. <laughs> Please, Ms. Munoz. Yes, thank you for an excellent presentation. Um, I certainly am supportive of the outdoor learning. You know, so many of these families, as as you stated, that are social economically disadvantaged, don't have a backyard and the front yard and area. And, you know, so much um, is needed in terms of mental health and wellness for the outdoors. So thank you so much. I am that supportive of that and also for the early learning and at Harding School. Thanks for all you're doing. I'd like to just add on, Ms. Munoz, that we do have plans to engage the um, community be beyond the school, the zero to five community, through programs in conjunction with the Santa Barbara um, um, Public Library, the Stay and Play program, so we can get um, students on the space with all of the engaging activities so that they can um, begin to discover before they're even at school. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks. Any other comments from board members? Ms. Caps. Yeah, to, just to echo, I, I do think uh, this for little kids, especially to be outdoors and to utilize the space, I appreciated seeing uh, the juxtaposition of Harding and the need for green space around it. So, um, so thanks for the attention to that in our community. I really appreciate it. Please, Ms. Alvarez. Yes. Uh, Thank you for this, that excellent uh, presentation. I was uh, deeply focused on everything you were saying and, and visualizing the program. And as you say, the STEAM um, component helps in language acquisition. So um, I'm very uh, grateful that you're doing this work. And I'm hoping that there'll be many, many families that will benefit from this program. I look forward to hearing updates. Thank you. Terrific. And Ms. Sims Moten. Yes, thank you. I, I know it's late, but I, I, I need some more excitement about early care and education <laughs> because this is the absolute start that will start to change this district. When they enter into this district, they'll be stronger to hear. We'll see much stronger uh, third grade results that we're looking for and where we will reduce and mitigate intervention dollars. When the fronts, we'll be able to use those dollars to, to build incredible facilities and, and to, to meet the trends. And so this is important now, continue to, to move forward on this. And of course, this is a pilot and we certainly want to be able to spread this throughout the district. And we want early learning to be a part of every conversation that we had because the best start certainly ends up in, in with a with a better ending with regards to that so i just i just want to appreciate the opportunity that it was here to to talk about this we'll have more reports about this and continue to have the voice of our youngest folks and even from birth to five even looking at prenatal because they're ready to go everybody's and, and supporting parents as a first teacher and strengthening them in, into what they know because when we do this zero to five it changes the trajectory of a community it makes it stronger so thank you Great. I couldn't have said it better, but I did want to say almost the same thing, that this is a, a brilliant and exciting plan, um, especially because not only of the, the for the immediate effects it will have, but for the children and the families, but also it will reverberate right into the future, not only with increased learning and literacy and mathematics, um, but also increasing 
um, outdoor learning, environmental awareness and appreciation, sustainability, all the things. And what happens when you change what happens in early learning is that it changes later learning. And students say, I, hey, I haven't been out much uh, outside much today. Uh, shouldn't I be going outside? And shouldn't we be doing this? And shouldn't we be incorporating more play? It will change schools, as Ms. Sims Moten said, and it will change education. So I'm very excited. Thank you again for the report. And that takes us on to our last report, which is the report on illustrative um, math K-5 pilot. And I'll turn that over to Ms. Escobedo, Ms. Lawfridge. Thank you so much. And yes, I am going to turn it over to actually uh, Craig, who should be up uh, as a presenter. Brian, if we could elevate uh, Dr. Craig Snyder, I'll start us off. Thank you, Sierra. Good evening, board. It's great to, to be here tonight to talk to you about illustrative mathematics. Um, as you may know, in 2017, our sixth grade team, after a lot of thought and input, adopted math, uh, illustrative math. It's a highly re regarded, highly rated um, by Ed Reports uh, curriculum. And it has been um, what our sixth grade team has been having professional learning and working with. In 2019, illustrative math approached us and we brought it to this board for approval to engage in an IM illustrative math alpha pilot. Um, we started that in the 2019-2020 school year and we were able to be on the ground floor of the design of the curriculum meaning our teachers were able to give input on, on things that were needed to support emergent multilingual students, on the practice problems, on the strategies, and how to create more oral language. As such, they incorporated our feedback and came back with another version for IM Beta. This board approved that um, pilot as well. And we have now taken it to our instructional council and to those piloting teachers and are here tonight to um, talk to you about a pathway for uh, adoption and a public viewing and 30 day input opportunity. So I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Dr. Craig Snyder who will go through this, why we need I am math with mathematical precision and um, we'll be here to answer any questions. Go ahead, Craig. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you board members. Thank you, Dr. Maldonado. Um, Brian, you can go to the next slide. Uh, I'm definitely excited to talk to you about why I am math for our K-5 uh, students and teachers. Uh, the main reason is that illustrative math vision is the same vision that we have for elementary math. They're in alignment. And part of that vision is through having a strong, building a strong foundation in skills and understandings and practices that our elementary students need to be successful in secondary education, but more importantly for life beyond, in, beyond high school, college and career. Um, illustrative Math and Santa Barbara Unified have a shared value in engaged, engaging students in problem-based language-rich learning and through collaborative conversations with peers and with teachers. They have a shared vision of developing mathematical fluency. Um, and that is making mathematical computations flexibly, accuracy, with, with accuracy and with efficiency. And those are, those uh, fluency is developed throughout all of the lessons, centers, routines, and practice problems of our illustrative math uh, materials that we have been piloting. Um, rather than taught as an isolated separate skill. And then illustrative math and Santa Barbara Unified share a vision of developing and using students' mathematical language. It promotes mathematical sense making and optimizes output verbally, visually, and most importantly in writing. And as, uh, as Sierra already described, we have had this ongoing partnership with illustrative math for four plus years or so. And it did start with our sixth grade uh, cohort in 2017 with adopted materials um, that were originally just middle school materials, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. 
and then as Santa Barbara Unified was selected by Illustrative Math to be a partner in designing the K through five materials in 2019, we were one of eight districts nationwide to partner with Illustrative Math. And that's because Illustrative Math saw Santa Barbara Unified as a influencer and as a pioneer in developing math curriculum as a partnership with these authors. And so what I want you to know is that Santa Barbara elementary teacher voices are directly in these K-5 materials that have now gone through an alpha and a beta partnership and now finally are available as a version one public release. Um, and so here you can see on the next slide there, Brian, how illustrative math has uh, some common, some additional common alignment with our, uh, with our school district. And that is around access and equity in mathematics education. And so in the materials, there are built-in supports for our, in, our emergent multilingual students through the mathematical language routines. These are routines that were co-developed by Illustrative Math and Stanford University's Understanding Language and Scale Organizations. These are embedded in every single lesson and they support the specific lesson activities so that teachers can support the language demands of those math lessons and teachers receive professional learning from illustrative mathematics facilitators on how to learn and practice these routines. Um, there are also family supports built in for every unit of every grade level. And those supports are important because they allow families at home to support the mathematics learning that students are doing in school. Additionally, new in version one will be a Spanish translation of all student and family facing uh, materials. And that will be something that will be welcomed in uh, for lots of communities, especially our dual language uh, sites. Uh, Brian, go ahead, next, next slide. Um, a second alignment between Illustrative Math and uh, Santa Barbara Unified is a value for monitoring and guiding student progress. And that's through this close tie between curriculum instruction and assessment. And so the illustrative math assessments that are embedded in these materials are, of course, aligned to California math standards. They are also aligned to the assessment measures, including CASP item types and especially the language rich performance tasks of Smarter Balanced. These, as you heard earlier in our uh, TK 12 math assessment uh, system proposal, these illustrative math K5 materials are ripe for use as part of that um, assessment task force for elementary mathematics. There's also built in diagnostic, formative, and summative assessments that support teachers to support students to finish unfinished learning. Earlier, there was discussion of opportunity gap and tier two supports. Those are built into these illustrative math K-5 materials. And then finally, there are also ex exploration problems, ways to extend grade level aligned activities for further depth so that students who are ready for more mathematically curious students can go deeper into grade level mathematics. Next slide. A third value that is shared between our two partner, partnering organizations is in uh, the inclusivity in math education. There, the illustrative math organization is committed to this like Santa Barbara Unified the collaborative learning opportunities, the instructional routines that invite students to bring their whole selves into math class is important. Uh, the problem solving context that positively reflect ethnically diverse cultures, linguistic cultures, and the supports for implementing culturally relevant responsive pedagogy are built into the program. And in fact, many of these have been added in the beta materials during this past school year. Um, 
which shows the responsiveness and the, uh, the dynamic nature of the illustrative map organization to respond to the need when feedback is given. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide, please. These last few slides are giving you a picture of our K-5 teachers, um, both words as well as some quantitative information of, from a survey that we provided um, for our current year beta participants to tell us about their, uh, their recommendations for the Illustrated Math K-5 uh, math program. And so I want to highlight on this first slide where you see sort of these virtual post-it notes, the first upper left corner, and I got to get a closer look at it myself. Um, I want to just read that quote out loud. I am provides many entry points for all types of students. It allows for collaboration and deeper thinking of mathematical concepts. So that was one of the rationales for a recommendation for the K-5 program from our one of our beta teachers. If you go to the next slide, Brian, you'll see another set of Santa Barbara Unified Teacher Voices. And again, I wanna highlight the first slide, uh, the first post-it where it says, teaches kindergarten and first grade students how to think and communicate their mathematical reasoning. Right there in a nutshell describes how important mathematical reasoning and communication, mathematical language is woven together. Um, and it happens at the very early start, which kind of aligns with the most recent presentation we just heard about our uh, first five. Well, right here is a teacher in Santa Barbara Unifying, Unified identifying that through our math program that we, are, um, that we have been using. Finally, slide, the next slide here, Brian, is a slide that shows more of the quantitative results of our survey of our beta teachers. And we gave them four options of what to choose for their level of recommendation for the Illustrative Math K-5 program. And as you can see, out of the 38 respondents, there is high level recommendation, recommendation, recommendation with reservation, and only one that said, do not, I do not recommend. And I wanted to highlight the voice of that person who gave a rationale. That person wrote, while the concepts and material covered in the books are obviously very important in meeting the kindergarten standards, it can be done without huge workbooks that are hard for kinder students to manage. I do not recommend purchasing these workbooks unless they've been severely streamlined. And what has happened, this isn't the only teacher in Santa Barbara Unified who had a similar experience with the kindergarten workbooks, nor in our, in, there were other districts that had kindergarten teachers who said the same thing. And so the publisher responded by saying, we got that feedback and we're gonna make the kinder work workbooks much more manageable, more streamlined, smaller because of the audience of kinder students needing to have some smaller materials to work with. So I just want to highlight the voices of our beta teachers who have been using these materials. And now I want to turn it over to Sierra to talk about a pathway to adoption on the next slide. Thank you, Dr. Snyder. Um, yeah, not only are we here to, to make this report on our pathway to adoption, but really to create an opportunity for coherence in our mathematics curriculum for kinder through sixth grade. Uh, we would be able to have one cohesive curriculum that really does engage the, the whole child with games and language routines and collaborative learning opportunities um, that really bring forward conceptual thinking, mathematic habits of mind, as well as uh, robust language and um, collaboration opportunities. So what we are here to do tonight is to announce that we have a 30-day window open for public to view um, the curriculum. The curriculum is available online and uh, there is a link in the flyers. Um, we will be hosting three sessions for the general public on June 2nd 
June 9th and June 17th from four to five. Uh, Craig and myself will be there and we will be able to answer any um, questions you may have about the curriculum, um, including you know, content and, and uh, progressions, et cetera. We also want to hear from our teachers because voice is important. Not only is their voice reflected in the changes from the alpha pilot to the beta, and that one example of real-time publisher change uh, that Craig cited at the end, but we also want to hear from them in, in general. And as such, we will be hosting a Thursday, May 27th this week at 3.15 voluntary uh, session, as well as Tuesday, June 1st at 3.15 in a webinar format. And um, all of those links were mailed out to teachers, um, inviting them to come. It is our intention and we, we do believe that the quality of the program and the 30-day the window will result in bringing forward the recommendation of the Instructional Council, the recommendation of the um, piloting illustrative math teachers, um, and our Ed Services recommendation to formally adopt on um, June 22nd, K-5, so that will be K through six coherent in mathematics, and then we can roll up our sleeves and get to the, the math work that we uh, need to do. Um, including um, the, the contract with Callahan that you approved earlier today. So that concludes our presentation on the pathway to adoption for illustrative mathematics. And Dr. Snyder and I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Board members, are there any questions or comments? Ms. Sims Moten. Yes, thank you for this report. I'm as excited about this as I am for the early care. Just so you know, I'm not, you know, bias only. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> on the slide about supporting the EM, uh, EMLS families in dual language, I, I really appreciate um, family support for every unit. Can for every unit? Can you talk a little bit about what that family support looks like? Uh, yes, it is in the form of, I mean, it's actually in two various forms. One is digitally, where the publisher has a family materials page. And the link that is in the flyer for parents and for the, and the public, uh, anyone can click on that and it goes to the publisher's page that will have teacher materials and family materials. So the family materials, pick your grade level, pick your unit, and then what it does is it has a nice description of the learning goals for that unit section by section. It has wonderful visuals, which because mathematics is a visual uh, discipline, so there's lots of representations that students will be using. Um, and then there's even try it at home types of activities or types of questions and tasks to do. Um, and then on the other hand, there is uh, supports that teachers can send home for, for family members in, in terms of uh, fam family letters that can go in possibly a parent square communication. That's maybe how teachers might do it here. Um, so those are the two main sources. And those are, again, are translated. Sixth grade has already been translated into Spanish and English and the K-5 family facing materials also will be translated this upcoming, for this upcoming school year. Um, thank you for that. I, I just have one more comment with regards to linking this to, our, I think the LCAP or maybe it's the LCFF, I'm not sure. But with regards to family engagement, because oftentimes I know the materials are there digitally, they're going home, but it, it might be interesting in terms of like have a family math night you know, so we can all kind of get together and share experiences because I've yeah. been, a, you know, I've been a mother who had some math and go, what is he talking about? But when you get together, you know, to be able to share that language. So is that something you can consider? I don't want to add more to you, but just, uh, again, a way of engaging families. Certainly. And we already have wonderful examples of family math nights that happen uh, in our sites, yes, particularly at the elementary level. I've attended many myself. Um, and so, yes, we can, with a coherent program that is kindergarten through sixth grade, what a wonderful opportunity for families to see a progression of everything from uh, fluency, because every grade level from kindergarten through sixth grade has a, is part of the story of mathematical fluency. So there, it would be great for families to see that progression all the way up. 
There's also a wonderful opportunity through Family Math Nights to show mathematical representations and how they are used at every grade level to get at the learning goals. Um, and a progression of mathematical representation would be a great experience for families to, to do with kids and teachers on a family math night. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Caps, thank you. I'm just going to add on to my colleague, Ms. Mswoten. Um I, I appreciate hearing about the, the um, curriculum workshops that you're doing that you are you know at the end of the year so it's a busy time so i just just the more the, the more the better uh cognizant of how much work you have to do i just hear as a parent a common uh phrase is i don't know how to help my kid with the math homework because it's so different than when we did math and now it's changing even further as which is a good thing so um i'm just thinking you know too also you know we're we're more disconnected from the classroom than ever before I'm thinking towards uh, back to school night and all of the things that we can, you know we can do to continue um, the education of this of these new these new approaches uh, because they really are new for the parents entirely new for the parents so uh, just put it, putting in a plug for uh, parent uh, math skills as well thanks thank you and Ms. Alvarez. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Schneider. Thank you, uh, Ms. Uh, Sierra Laughlin. Thank you so much. I could um, listen to you speak all night about mathematics. As you know, math is my first love. Um, in this parent nights, I, are they also held in Spanish? I know that uh, I, I'm very thrilled to see this uh, support for, for EML families and dual language. I, I know that Kids do not hate math. Kids do not like they feel the way they feel when they're learning math because sometimes there's that big barrier, the language barrier. So my question is, are there math nights specifically for Spanish speaking parents? So in regards to the public viewing, all of those webinars, the way we are showing the parents the curriculum, will have a simultaneous um, interpretation. Um, and that really is an opportunity for the community and the public to um, view the curriculum that we are proposing to bring forward on the 22nd. Uh, in terms of, of math nights on campus, yes, I believe that our, our language access unit and our principal leadership are committed to ensuring equal access and uh, language supports, however appropriate. And having been an elementary principal, I can tell you that family math night is one of the best things ever to just see them playing games and talking about math and talking about their thinking about math. It is super engaging and we definitely will take your recommendations and, and bring that about. Um, when we do come back to the board on the 22nd, we will be also sh showing you our plan for the professional learning that accompanies this adoption. Um, and we can talk as well about how we're gonna communicate that to stakeholders and, and make the announcement so that everyone comes on a board with us in terms of math. And one of the highlights of I am, and I might ask uh, Dr. Snyder to go a little deeper into it is, is that they have math games and math routines. So you can develop your fluency in mathematical um, knowledge but be having a good time at the same time. And that is a great thing to send home. Early on, uh, Dr. Snyder sent those kits out during um, school closure in the pandemic. He's being very humble, but he's also planning our summer school curriculum with the pre and post. And we're using the IM adaptation packets. And that's based on our STAR math score. So he's looked at that and said, this is what we need to target. So we're being very, very thoughtful in how we use these materials and, um, and how they, they go together and it would be great to be able to bring forward a coherent um, K-6 curriculum that also has Spanish resources for families um, and is on the progressive side of mathematics and the new math framework. Thank you. Also, would you send me that link so I can view the materials? Uh, it's not on our slide. It's on your slide, but not on our slide. <laughs> Thank we will you. Do that. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, Ms. Ms. Munoz. Yes, no, just real quick. And thank you for the culturally responsive mathematics. Um, as our students are, you know, as you know, we're looking at equity 
and for our English learners, uh, English, start, sorry, English um, speaking students too, just having something relevant and something that they could, you know, wrap their head around. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And um, I'm very excited about this also. Uh, illustrative Mathematics has been a leader in equity in mathematics education. And of course, uh, that follows along with the board and district goals. I also just wonder if you could spend a moment giving an example to about what, well, we kind of call it backwards mapping. In other words, you start where you want to be and design everything backwards so that you can uh, start uh, you can reach your goal i wonder if you could tell us how the assessments in illustrative mathematics change the teaching well yeah i think what is really powerful about the variety of assessments is that they're both summative and formative and diagnostic so if you have your summative learn that are aligned to learning goals the summative assessment, you can backwards map. So think about an end of unit assessment. That's a summative assessment of learning. There are section level checkpoints. I think of those as formative checkpoints that match to the learning goals of each section of a unit. And then each lesson within a section has what illustrative math calls a cool down. And the cool downs are tiny little formative assessments at the end of every lesson that allow both a teacher and a student to kind of know, did I meet today's learning goals? And illustrative math has built into the teacher materials um, moments and, and questions and ways for a teacher to respond to those daily cool downs, depending on what the, cool what the student thinking is on that cool down. And so it can make the next instructional move. And then if you build that up lesson by lesson, you get to section by section, and then finally to the summative. So there's your backwards map that I hopefully laid out as, and again, it all actually also starts with a diagnostic, what are called pre-unit problems, practice problems that give teachers a sense of, and kids a sense of, am I ready for the learning goals of this? And if, a teacher determines, wait, my students aren't ready. That's when I can do some of those centers, some of the student uh, adaptation packs that Sierra mentioned that build in prior grade level what uh, those, in, those of us in math education call unfinished learning from prior grade levels because of the coherence of mathematics education. You do need to take what you've learned from prior grade levels to build and be ready for grade level material. And so there's the whole map that starts at the end that you can map all the way to, not just the beginning of the unit, but prior grade level content. Does that Thank help? You. Yes, absolutely. That sounds amazing. And of course, I must admit that part of my goal would be that illustrative mathematics uh, changes the way that we grade. Uh, to Joe Feldman's point. Um, and uh, so with that, I think that we have concluded and are very grateful for this report and concluded all of our reports for tonight. So board members, I would uh, point your attention toward H and I, which are the coming events and also the future agenda items. We have a busy, busy June, not only with coming events, but also with two board meetings that are packed full. Uh, members of the public, I'd just like to ask you to please check out the district website for information about the school promotions and graduations, especially because things may change a little if we go into the yellow tier. Um, and with that, I'll announce that our next board meeting is on Tuesday, June 8th. It's a regular board meeting and uh, we begin at 6.30 p.m. And at this time, the plan is for it to be live streamed and public participation to be virtual participation only, but that could always change also. So as we, oh, Dr. Maldonado, please. Clarification. Uh Today's report from public health stated that we are not yet entering the yellow tier and are not expected to reach it by next Tuesday. Oh. So we expect that if we do, it'll be the first week in yellow, which will still remain, uh, will, which will keep oh, the first current week safety in yellow. protocols. Thank you. Thank yes. you for that clarification. 
So as we adjourn tonight, I'd like to remind everyone that the, this uh, next week marks the end of the school year, a uh, school year that is like none other before. So on behalf of the board, thank you to everyone who persevered and trusted and worked so hard in the face of disappointment and confusion and the many challenges that were caused by the pandemic. All of us are transitioning in June to the new normal, but to those who are graduating, as you begin this next adventure of your life, I'll simply quote the great tennis player and humanitarian Arthur Ashe, start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. Tonight's meeting of the Santa Barbara Unified School Board is adjourned. Good evening.